This is the Copper Crab Podcast. I am Cheney Crab. I am Naveen Copperweiss, coming at you live. Live. Live on Twitch right now, or we are you are hearing this from the future. Tomorrow yep. on YouTube. If you would like to buy merch for the podcast, then you can hit www.coppercrab.bigcartel.com. If you would like to buy merch from our band, Entheos, like the beautiful pink hoodie that Naveen has on right now, then head to entheosstore.com. That's E-N-T-H-E-O-S store.com. All of your support is greatly appreciated. I'm over here writing notes to all of you guys and... We just love you so much, so thank you for for supporting us and picking up merch. We've got some cool stuff in there, so check it out. But you will get a note if you order merch from us. That is true. A handwritten note. A cool note, too, Signed might, with might I add. A cool note. Well, it's it black. is a cool note. It's black. It's written in silver or gold Sharpie. That's right. It depends on which Sharpie has not uh, ran out of ink that day. Mm-hmm. Because usually it's like me going through 20 different Sharpies. I'm like, oh, this one's dead now. <clears throat> See, we got some people in the chat that can confirm they got a cool note. They, they're getting cool notes out here. So if you haven't gotten yourself yeah. a cool note, and you know what? If you write me a cool note, well, you're writing the band a cool note. I'm the one who writes the cool note back. But if you write a, us a cool note in the little memo section, then we will directly respond to that. So there you go. There you go. And man. if you want to be a part of this live chat, be a part of the podcast. Go over to Twitch. Go to Twitch. We and subscribe or whatever you do over there. <laughs> we haven't quite figured it out. You subscribe so wait, and subscribe, you like and you it's follow. Free and if they no, following is free, subscribing costs <laughs> okay. five bucks. So definitely subscribe and forget about the follow. <laughs> we want your five bucks. Yeah. <laughs> Just definitely subscribe. <laughs> Uh, what was but I yeah, just going to talk Then you can about? directly communicate with us. That's right. Um, we make we ourselves available. Out. I think it's a pretty We're good here. time, and I also think it's a good value of free or five dollars a month. <laughs> so. I do too. I wholeheartedly stand behind that statement. So um, I would do it. I would go. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? If I, I only had five dollars to it. my name, I would. Roll right over to the twitch.com slash copper crab and I'd join in the group chat on Tuesday nights at 730 Central Standard Time. You know what I would And I'd pay do? my last five dollars to me and Naveen. I would act, what I would actually do in real life, like if I was actually me, <laughs> yeah. I would subscribe for like a month or two. And then I would be like, why the hell am I still fr- paying for this? And then I would cancel it. <laughs> hey, do that too. Then we got 10 bucks. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah, that is... <laughs> That's th- I guess that's, you know, what I would do. I hope that you don't do that, though. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely don't do that. Just keep subscribing month after month. Uh, but yeah, so we're <laughs> hanging out tonight. No guest. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Before the show, we were talking about how Naveen got rid of every single metal shirt that he owned. To yeah. a man who <clears throat> sold him his first drum set. It was actually a different guy. Different guy. <laughs> Wait, but what? he was a flea market uh, metalhead. Oh, really? Yeah. So and we were talking because Naveen, yeah. is, this all goes back to how Naveen is really good at haggling. Yeah, I have, I have my methods. Because <clears throat> you're a, flea, a product of the flea market. A flea market kid, if you will. Yeah. FMK. Yeah. So uh, I was raised at the flea market, man. <laughs> that's where your parents found you you're just yeah. uh, a and, little uh, baby swindle or er, swaddled in the <laughs> they swindled you you're swaddled in the that's true in the the clothing at the flea market the old clothing but yeah it was a good time and i always could get what i wanted and you know haggle with people you're also really good at finding stuff on the side of the road i am good at finding free shit free things on the side of the road it's like weird it's it is actually strange. I have a well, I had a drafting desk. I think it's in our storage space now. But you found it on the side of the road, and I see it at the freaking what's yeah. it called, Michaels mm-hmm. or Hobby Lobby. I see it there, and it's a two hundred dollar table. Yeah, it one time I wanted condition. one of those Gibraltar like kick pads. I'm sure a lot of the drummers know what I'm talking about. I really wanted one. To me, that just sounds like a thing you would call it, like a. 
It's like a practice pad. Like a, I, I was like, man, I really want to get one of those. And gym. I was just walking down the street in San Francisco and just found it. Just I was like, really? Oh, there it is. I'll take it. You dreamed it into life. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. I feel like in <laughs> San Francisco, they there's probably a lot of if you go to the right neighborhood, there's probably a lot of stuff out on the street that people just don't want to deal well, with. Well, most people just aren't. Uh, they don't have their uh, their eye out. Yeah. Like they're just walking down the street. And I, like when I'm walking down the street, I'm like, what? What's the free shit that's laying around? One time you found like a thousand dollars. Yeah, I found nearly a thousand dollars. I found a hundred bucks on tour, our last tour. That's true. Like I was walking into this hotel, and it was just a fucking hundred dollars. I just didn't even think twice. Grabbed it, put that's it in my it. pocket. Didn't even think in. twice. You know, just boom. That's crazy. Get me that. 100. So you are dreaming. <clears throat> I still have that hundred reality. Too, by the way. Really. Yeah, I, I see it, it every... Oh, you hit it. I hit it. That's so that I didn't <clears throat> find it and spend it on Starbucks. No, I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to hide this. Because I would have done that. Just have it. I would have slowly spent it on Starbucks for 35 a day. Just four shots of espresso. But yeah, I did get my first <laughs> drum set at the flea market. And this is the guy that actually introduced me to metal. He was a guy who would sell like metal shirts from Mexico and drums and like BC rich guitars and shit. And, uh... It was fucking awesome. Like, and <clears throat> I was kind of already into like Green Day and stuff like that. Yeah. And then I walked by his booth and uh, my mom actually bought me the kit. I wonder how much she paid for it. 500 bucks. Wow. That is a lot to drop on. At, I yeah. mean. So it was like a full kit with stands and cymbals and a pedal and like a full rig. How old were you when you got that? Uh, I was 10. So you, or I might have been eleven, and at that point. your dad already had a kit though. Yeah, and I had his for a while. He let me borrow it, and then my mom like saved up and bought me that. Because I think the guy was just like, if you have five hundred bucks, I'll like put together you a kit, like you know, a rig. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, whatever happened to that kit? Uh, I sold it. Okay. Those are the type of things that like now looking back, we were just talking about this the other day because you said that you didn't, you don't have that many keepsakes from animosity. No, I really And don't. we were talking about this the other day, like now that matters to me. Now I would like to have your, I wish we had your first drum kit. Yeah, I know. It was a CB 700. I have never, that's so. <clears throat> have you heard of that? No. Yeah, I know. Is that like a first act kit? CB 700. Is that a brand? Google, Google that, dude. CB seven hundred. Yeah, put that into Google. My uh, that my grandpa called me a CB. Yeah, I know. Whoa, that's really strange. My grandpa did call me CB because my name is Cheney Blaine. CB seven hundred. He was dude. the only one who ever called me that. Ripped it. I was ripping that thing, just fucking. So, did you play in any bands with that kit? Uh, yeah, I think so. Well, maybe not. I didn't have it for that long, and oh, then yeah. I like. It's the haggling. You sold it again. You sold it really quickly. Oh, I was constantly haggling shit, trading stuff with my neighbors. That's, That's how I got cool. my first guitar. That was it. Whoa! Things shot. Yeah, it's pretty shot. <laughs> I wonder if they're still around. I wonder how much it would they're cost. <clears throat> is it an, is it expensive? Definitely not. Not an expensive kit. And then uh, I actually traded. Well, I don't know drum prices. That's something that exists so outside of what I think about. Because drums, like, I saw a price for some, maybe a crash cymbal a few weeks ago. And it was like $700. Yeah, I know. I was just like, are you kidding me? I thought these things were like 25 bucks. Yeah. They're so expensive. They are, like, yeah. how do you become a drummer? Unless you are you have rich, someone rich around you or someone who's you work all summer yeah all summer yeah i mean how much is a snare drum i know that i mean any any amount really however however much you want to spend i know that brady was like taste nineteen hundred dollars yeah something like that uh, i mean do you need to spend that much on a snare no do you think you know this is a debate that goes back for a while but does the more expensive the instrument the better it sounds. Um, <clears throat> I I sort of agree with that with cymbals. 
Mm. Cheap symbols don't sound good. That's very true. That's or, very true. Well, hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna get. Like, let me clarify that. Uh huh. In particular, crashes. Yeah. You can get away with a cheaper ride, in China, and uh, to, splashes. To but. a certain extent, I think some rides begin to s- sound cheap too. But yeah, I yeah. know what you mean. Like crashes that ride that I use is a, I would consider a cheaper ride. It's two hundred bucks. Oh wow, that's surprising to me. One of the rides that I use. The one that you have on your kit right now? Uh, not that one. That one's probably more than that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. However, for a lot of instruments, with guitars, for instance, it has a lot to do with the hands of the guitar player who's yeah. playing it. But, I mean, you know, you're going to want some upper-end gear. Let's face it. Yeah. That's part of the fun. True. Acquiring the gear. Like, really want... I, I love that. That's one of my favorite things. Really wanting some crazy piece of gear. And you get it. You're all stoked. Like, yes. What do you want right now? Uh, gear wise. Yeah. I just want more shit for the studio. I want like a new additional interface, some preamps, microphones. Yeah. That's what I would be. I feel you. I that's mean, I'd be trying to get straight I, up. I feel you on that. Yeah. I mean, as far as drums and guitar stuff goes, I'm pretty set for now. <clears throat> I yeah. do have some new drum shit coming to me though. That's true. I don't know if we're am I allowed to announce, make the big announcement? I think we've already talked about it. Is that we're going double real life double bass. Yeah, double double kick. I can't wait. It's gonna be so cool. We're gonna look so cool. Yeah, it's gonna look super <laughs> I'm sick. so excited. Cool. I'm just thinking of how it's gonna look on stage and like don't get me wrong, I'm okay with a just a single bass drum and you're playing, you know, doing your double kick pedal or whatever the thing is called. But <laughs> I like two kick drums, dude. Yeah, Come yeah. on. It's like metal. That's that's the metal kit. Yeah. Then I'm going to get like, I don't know. I don't know what, what I'm going to do yet, but two cool kick drum heads. It's finally going to force you to get a bigger trailer. <laughs> we probably uh, we we do can't need a bigger fit trailer. another kick in there. Yeah. It's not good. We have a little while to get a bigger trailer, but we are announcing a tour pretty soon. So it's already announced in some places. It's actually. already announced in some places. Yeah, I think it got a. Uh, there was a little spoiler alert out there somewhere. Totally. Um. But yeah. So today we are going to have Nick is going to call in in like fourteen minutes. So we should start talking about the new Job for a Cowboy record, which Naveen you played on. I certainly did. It's out this Friday. It's called Moon Healer. It's really sick. Yep. I went through today and I listened to like a uh, job for a cowboy. Some songs off of a lot of songs off of each record just to see like, you know, the way that the band has grown over time. And it's been. I think that JFAC actually they really started writing death metal records a long time ago. You know, it's not new. They've just gotten better and better at, and kind of pinpointed down like the JFAC thing yeah. more and more over the years. And the new record is really sick. And yeah. I think uh, like a logical progression in the band. Yeah, definitely. Like it makes sense. <clears throat> I think they totally like came into their own with their, I mean, original sound. I agree with that. It's kind of like death metal Mastodon. It, I can see kind that. Like yeah. A, rock ish vibe but uh still death metal so fast and technical and everything yeah it's it's like a a more technical did you say tech death mastodon is that what you said kind of yeah i mean it has like that more chordy vibe on guitar i don't really know how to explain it absolutely i i know exactly what you mean and i think that when people hear the entire record or just from the singles that are out so far that they'll yeah, understand I mean, there's what there's three we're songs out and they're a good example of, I would say these three songs really give you the vibe of the album for sure. Yeah, totally. So I don't think a lot of people know that you, you recorded the record a long time ago. Um, yes, I tracked drums for it in <clears throat> 2020. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it was 2020. Mm-hmm. It was like... And it was really weird because I flew to Florida uh, to record it with Jason Sukov, who records them. And uh, he... The nearest airport to him is Orlando, which is totally like Disneyland out. 
And I remember I was like the only person in the airport. And it was like so cool. Well, really? Yeah. So I landed and everything's like, welcome to, you know, Orlando, home of Disneyland. And everything's like the whole airport is fucking Disneyland pretty much. And uh, yeah, I was like, there was just no one in there. I mean, I wasn't the only person, but it felt like it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was a really, really fun experience, honestly. I've always wanted to record with Jason and go to his studio. And uh, yeah, it was just the shit, dude. It was super sick. He was in Florida. It was, uh, the weather was way nicer in Florida than yeah, northern, I think, northern California. Yeah, we lived in Santa Cruz. Wow, that's crazy. I would wake up every day. And he had a bunch of beer in his fridge because he doesn't drink and someone left it there. So I would wake up. He wakes up like really late in the day. So I was waking up before. I would probably be up for like two hours before he woke up. I would wake up. I would do a little workout by the pool. And then I would just drink a beer. Because <laughs> he has a pool. I remember you texting me and, and saying you were doing that. Drink a beer and then go for a dip. And I was like, God, this, that's this the life. Like the sickest, dude. <laughs> Living yeah. the life. I would never like get drunk. I would literally just drink one and it was just like so nice and it was nice outside. Yeah. And, uh, so how does he have, uh, the studio? How is this house set up? Like, how is the studio? Where's the drum room? And yeah, so he has, um, his house is basically, uh, it feels like you're just in a studio Mm -hmm. and there's, uh, Mark's is Mark Lewis's house is kind of a similar vibe, except he's got, the it's house kind of is house, separate. Yeah, house yeah. is like Jason's is. I I believe at one time it was the whole studio, and then oh, wow. they made another kind of. There's another building that's kind of down the driveway that became the drum room, like a garage. Yeah, and so that's like the main drum tracking room, and there's a small uh, control room in there, but the main control room where he like does the mixing and stuff is in, in the house. So there's like a living room and then his bedroom. And then there's like a mixing room, which is like where I stayed. I stayed in the mix room. There's like a couch in there and stuff. Wow. That's right. It's kind of cool. It's weird. It's really cool. <clears throat> so how long were you there? It must have been uh, a week. I think I was there for 10 days. And do you, did you like have the, the stuff? Uh, had you practiced it? Was no, it rehearsed no. before you went there? Or how did you no. track the album? Uh, so usually when I do um, stuff like that, I if we have 10 days, I'll just kind of like listen to it a bit. I mean, there's demos, and they were actually probably the coolest, most open band out of anybody I've ever worked for in like, giving me free reign to do whatever I want. A lot of the times people will say, Oh yeah, do whatever you want. And then you do it. And then they're like, oh, can you actually not do that? You know, not do whatever you want. <clears throat> so they really wanted me to kind of just do whatever. And uh, I think it's really cool. Like the way the drums turned out is I'm pretty proud of it. I th- so yeah, I wouldn't, um, I would disregard a lot of shit that the demo drums were doing. And uh, so they had like demo drums written before you. Yeah, went? it was really a lot more uh, like they, the songs weren't as hashed out as they are now. It was a, it was a really early <coughs> stage to be recording the drums. Yeah. So they kind of like went back and even rewrote some riffs after you left. Yeah. I think they went <clears throat> back through and kind of like refined everything a lot more. Mm-hmm. Cause yeah, it was more, the demos were a lot more rough and, but it, enough for us to record drums. Yeah. So we, uh, yeah, we just like kind of work on it in sections and just experiment, see what sounded cool. And you know, ultimately, it was kind of just me, and it was just me and Jason, and it was just kind of his call to have me do stuff that he thought was cool. But for the most part, um, I don't think there was anything I did where he was like, oh, don't do that. You know, we were pretty much in agreement the whole time. Yeah, someone was asking, someone left a comment on my status that I posted before this. I think it was Dustin Howell. He asked, basically, if you, like, brought your own Naveen flavor to the ta- to 
the recording or if you had JFAC their previous material in mind or if you had any regard for that <clears throat> or you're just kind of doing your no. thing. Yeah, no, I just <laughs> went in there and uh, just did my thing. I mean, they said, do your thing. So if yeah. you say that to me, I'm going to do it. I always think that's really cool because I've seen people hire you and then completely take the character out of your drumming, which to me, yeah. it doesn't make sense to hire someone if you're going to take out the the like signature sound of that person out of the recording. Yeah. It's and like, why, why are you even having me do this? Like just yeah. get, just program it or have someone else do it. Right. But don't get me wrong to a certain yeah. extent. I think that like production is good. Producing the material is good and telling you, you know, don't maybe just like chill out for this yeah. section. Yeah. Yeah. That's chill. But if they completely take out like any fill that you do just to kind of serve the, because some people get, really obsessed with the demos that they make. Demo and I think, yeah, demo itis. You've talked about this with guitar pro. Like some people get really used to yeah. hearing those guitar pro tracks. So they track exactly what they hear on guitar pro. I think people get demo itis. That's honestly something that I've been trying to work against. Yep. Not completely thinking that the song is like, like I think it's okay to completely change the demos in some places yeah. if you need to. Yeah, I, I like that approach. I, I like uh, having it a little more open. Yeah. And then just kind of building as you go and seeing kind of where, where things go because it's going to change when you get certain things on there. Yeah, right. absolutely. But, I mean, I don't know. I think we you, you and I have got better about kind of predicting what, what it should sound like. You That's know, true. Like but the EP was kind of like, there was no real major changes once we started recording. Except the the first single that we're putting out, there's a huge change. I was thinking about it today, this the like the slow part before the big part, you yeah, know what I'm yeah. talking about? That was completely different. The melody was completely different. Well, it wasn't completely different, but I didn't There was like an extra part in there. Yeah, yeah. and then the big built the big ending part became something <clears throat> kind of different because I was going to sing that and I didn't end up singing it. It's true. So things change over time. They do. Uh, but like you're saying, it just it's just kind of like what ends up serving the material in the long run because as you're recording, things iron themselves out. Yeah, definitely. Like you, you start, I don't know how other people demo things, but I demo vocals like piece by piece and sometimes i'll demo the end of a song and not have another part of the song demoed so once i go in and actually track the song it completely changes just because i'm i'm trying to iron out the the part before it i'm trying to iron out the entire song and not have it be you know exist in a weird way right you and you do that in the demo stage you're not doing that no, I'm saying that I go in, I'll go into the studio and iron those parts out. Demo, yeah. oh, demoing, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do piece by piece. You know that. It's 100%. like sometimes I'll go in and I'll only have one part demoed out and another part is like, what are we doing here? Totally. 100%. Sorry, I had to send Nick the, uh, he said he didn't get the link. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah sorry, you guys, if you're in Twitch right now, we're uh we might cut this on the podcast. We might not, but we're, uh, Nick is going to call in in a couple of minutes and keep talking about this JFAC. So we had to get him the link, but yeah, I mean, I keep it. Yeah. I keep it, uh, pretty, I've gone more into keeping things a little more, sh uh, streamlined in the demo phase. Yeah. And then, yeah. What, does, it, that, it what also, does that mean that you're, that you're I'm not getting in there and like intricately programming every fucking drum hit. It's yeah, like exactly. I, the drums totally. are just going to be real simple, like totally not what I would oh, absolutely. play. Yeah. Like we were, you're, we're writing right now and you're like the stuff you're writing is super simple compared yeah. to what I'm envisioning that the, yeah. but now it's like you and I have been writing together so long. I know what. I can predict when you're going to do something crazy. Yeah. You got it's, the, it's easier. I feel like I was telling you this today. I feel like our styles and our like ways of writing are starting to really coalesce. So we really understand each other and yeah. what we're going to do now. So it's ironing itself out more and more over time. It's really Just fun. Man. I feel like we're finding our stride. I do too. I'm really excited to show this. E I know that we're talking about, about the, uh, I know we went couple, from talking I'm really excited to show this other one too. But yeah. And then like, I think 
the what the material is is going to change like how you play it. So with the job for cowboy stuff, it's all it's a lot more. There's a lot more riffs. There's like a lot more going on. Yeah. So it's appropriate to have drums that are what I would call jazz hands. Yeah. Whereas certain, you know, if I'm doing the white chapel thing, it's like they wanted a little more mean potatoes in some spots. Totally. You know, or a machine head. That makes sense to mm-hmm. me. And that's definitely not. They, those also, those guys gave me a lot of freedom too. Yeah. I mean, you can, when I hear your fills, I can tell it's you, you, your fills sound like you. There are, there are certain aspects of your style that you just can't take away. So it becomes obvious, but I think that you did a really good job on the new J fact. It sounds it, you can tell that it's you playing. It and turned out fucking awesome. And like Jason did a great job with the way the drums sound and everything. Oh, they sound so good. So does he yeah. take a lot of time to like find tones and yeah, what's yeah. his? Yeah. Pretty long time. Pretty similar to Mark. So you guys are just like trying out, hashing yeah. out different sounds constantly for a couple days mm-hmm. for two days. Wow. That's yeah. insane. Yep. I don't. It starts to annoy me after a while. I'm like, dude, it's fine. Let's <laughs> yeah, fucking like, start recording, play? man. Like that would be like me having <clears throat> to like warm up for two days. Yeah. <laughs> like, dude, start it's tracking. a crash symbol, man. It sounds like a crash. Yeah. Let's go here. Where, whereas vocals, though, are the polar opposite because any warming up that I do to go into the studio, I do like before I get there. So I'm just like thrown into it. You know, we're like doing official business within 10 minutes of me yeah, getting yeah. into the studio right, right for you it's you know yeah it's, i don't it is I have nice. no warm-up yeah, it is nice to get like a couple hours well yeah and then like you get, get the, you get kind of used to your new environment yeah put the vibe out when you're tracking in a place that's different than you're what you're used to you're like getting you know you're adapting are you getting nick into the uh i've got him if you want oh you all got right him. Okay. Really okay. Good. Yo, we got Nick on the line here. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, and we're back. How's right. it going, dude? <laughs> good, man. Uh, just super busy. Like every like three months, it seems to get like progressively busier in my life. Probably just because I have a, a hard time saying no to people. <laughs> yeah. So like, oh, I'm yeah. always, uh, you know, I'm trying to like, you know, evenly promise and evenly de- deliver. <laughs> Cause it's, it starts, it's hard when it starts going the other way and you're like, Oh no, promising everybody stuff. And then like, hopefully not under delivering, um, yeah. but it's great thing to have. I mean, you know, could be fucking locked down again. So I'm, totally. I'm grateful to be doing stuff and being busy and, um, grateful for this, uh, record Hell to yeah. come out, man. It's been, you know, I found tracks that go back to 2014 from this. Yeah. I was so. going to say, I said already, uh, like I recorded drums in 2020. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. But yep. 2014, remember, holy shit, okay, that must have been like right after uh, Sun Eater came out. Pretty much, yeah, right after the, I mean, Tony just goes home and he's, he's just always playing guitar. So it was one of those things where it was like, um, you know, after kind of Johnny decided that, you know, he found out he, uh, he was pregnant or his wife was pregnant, which, whichever way. They, um, they were but, pregnant. <laughs> yeah, they, they were pregnant. Both of them. Um, and then they kind of, you know, we had offers and stuff for, for Sunny Year because it was a really good response. And then it was like, um, we knew that like nothing really was going to happen, but Tony didn't ever stop writing. Uh-huh. And so he just randomly every kind of few months, be like, oh, here's another song. Here's another song. And then around like, 16 17 after we did the one show the one show world tour in vancouver um <laughs> then it was like oh shit there's like eight songs here what you did know? you did you play modified ghost or something yeah uh-huh okay yep. yeah. we did that one time anytime now like especially with like cephalic or something where i have like you know two two shows or three shows in a year <laughs> like yeah. we'll print like world tour and just put the fucking two or three dates on the back <laughs> i love and that. people that shirt sells hot people love those shirts man <laughs> that's hilarious so that's the, literally the only show that you guys played after sun eater came out that's it yep wow so besides besides uh blue ridge so two shows in 10 years so nine 11 years fuck but wow. you always knew that there was going to be an album after that or did you i think i think so yeah i mean there were times when I was just like, well, probably about 150 times throughout the entire process of the last, like, you know, eight years of, of deciding that we were going to do it, that I was like, this is never fucking coming out. You know, like yeah. so many times I'd be on the, I'd be, I remember talking to Johnny and I think I was 16 or 17 and talking on the phone. And like, we had eight, nine songs together. We were talking about getting in to record with Sukov and, uh, 
it would be like, oh, I got pushed back. It's going to be pushed back. So we're going to, we're going to try for March of 18. And I was like, it's never going to go. I was like, 19, it's going to maybe come out in 19. And then yeah. each year it'd be like <clears throat> six, six more months, six more months. And <laughs> yeah, then fucking yeah. the lockdowns happened. And then it was like, this is never fucking coming out. Yeah. But, um, so it's kind of surreal. And I'm in a, like kind of a, a weird, like sort of bittersweet stage of it where like, you know, it's what fucking three days till it comes out. Yeah. And like for eight years, it's been something that's never going to come out or it's coming out way far in the future. Even when we delivered the record to metal blade in um, last year in like yeah. late January or early February or whatever, it was like, they were like February 24 and we were like, Oh, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> that's the worst when you hand in a, an album to the label and they're like, all right, vinyl can't be pressed until 2030. So that's yeah. when we're going to put I it know. out. Yeah, but when they hit bill. you with that date, it's like, so our manager will be oh, like, it's heartbreaking. All right, I'm thinking 2026, March. And you're just like, <laughs> are we going to be a band at that point? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Am that's I going Steve, to want to? Yeah. Steve Davis, yeah. you guys, right? Yep, yeah, Steve yeah. Davis, good old Steve. Well, he'll just hit me with Hell a date yeah. that's like so far away, and I'm just like, fuck, all right, I guess. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Do Time does go fast enough, though. Yeah, yeah. I've got a lot like, better oh, now. Yeah. It's here. I've got a lot better now where I'm like, it'll be that eventually. You it's know? true. Yeah. And I think that the time between when you turn it in and, you know, it's finished then and then you put it out, like, that's the last time that you have with that record. That's when the record yeah. actually belongs to you. No one is like judging your record and saying this shit, this sucks. This isn't as good <laughs> as their last thing or, you know, there's no judgment on it. So you can kind of just exist with it peacefully. Yeah. And I think there's something that's actually kind of beautiful about that time, even though, you know, it, it hurts to wait. And you're, yeah, I, that's a great point. Yeah. I, you know, and there's a part of it too, where it's like, I've been like, uh, I've thought about this a few times. I read a couple articles about it where people are like, do we, we're, we're sort of like in this stage of life now that we experience um, the present moment as like anticipated nostalgia. You know, it's, it's kind of crazy where it's like, you're, we sort of view things through the lens of the memories that they'll become. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and like a record is old after a week now. Yeah, you know? yeah, I know. I mean, yeah. you're like, oh, we, oh, that last record you guys put out. When you put on another one, you're like, well, fucking. Yeah, just, I know. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You know? they, when are you coming to Lawrence, Kansas, man? We were just there last night. Dude. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, totally. I know. They even start to talk about touring like that. Like, all right, what are you going to, what release are you going to have out for this tour next April so that I can pitch you guys for that so that I can tell them that you have something relevant out? Yeah, it's yeah. like, it's not just the way that like singles and everything are becoming it's the way that the entire industry is becoming they're they're you're not even getting tours depending on when you have stuff come out you know right right i've been interested to see your guys's because i've always loved the the concept i've, I've talked to uh i think yeah, i think he's like he's mudvane's lawyer but i think he also manages like ice nine kills or something and he had this this thing where he's like you know the the chronology of an album release should really be inverted um, for the way that uh, uh, streaming services, I mean, everything is re reverse chronological, uh, reverse chronological order, you know. So like, you're only as relevant as your what you just put out. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, for play uh, playlist curation, right? Like that's like, um, you only get to you know. For example, like there's a focus single for the record um, on Friday. Uh, yes. That's it'll be into the crystalline crypts, but we know it as Gwen, right? But yeah. um, we always have these pet names for all our yeah, songs yeah, and yeah. Tony, Tony picks titles. like very antiquated names <laughs> but um but up that you know and it's like how, why are you putting out a single i was like just asking like why are we putting out a single like on the day of the record because like the whole record will be out they're like well for playlist submissions yeah. and for playlist uh curation yeah. it's about a single you can't pitch the record and so it's just interesting this whole shift in the industry has sort of made it more important that things will be um i guess like the relevance is re uh, is directly related to um, how new the the music is, and so like the concept of working, you know, the two year album cycle that we've all been on forever. Um, I don't know if it really makes sense anymore. Oh, I think yeah. it's like there might be m make more sense to do you know smaller bits of music at a time, EPs or even singles, you know, one yeah. or two singles out at a time, and then you're constant because Spotify's uh, recent listeners, right, is is uh, or unique listeners is like listeners within the last 28 days right. yeah. and so it's like and that is always tied to the 
to that release, you know, having new releases. So it's interesting, especially watching Entheos come out. And I feel like you guys are always kind of hitting that, you know, it's like there's full lengths in the works, but you guys are always like doing something, which I think is fucking cool. And you could do different shit on those without people being like, oh, they really changed their sound. Yeah. You can put a single out that's different. Yeah. You can experiment. You can experiment. And it's, yeah, not an album. Yeah. And I enjoy that about it. But I also, so we're doing a thing where we put out like a music video with every, single that we roll out throughout the year and then it'll be an ep we'll release an ep at the end of the year but we're already writing our next ep so we're like trying to have things planned very far in advance now because that's just the nature of how it goes but i also think that you know as far as albums and putting albums out you're talking about the what do they call it the spotlight single or the focus yeah the focus Focus. track focus single. so (laughs) outside of those songs the singles and the focus track it seems like people don't really hear not as many people hear the rest of the album most people are just going to hear those tracks so it's like as an artist i want everyone to hear every track i want every song to have an equal chance in this climate because they're all songs that i really care about so i agree with you i think that and that's an interesting way to put it. Uh, Mudvayne's, however, Mudvayne's manager put it that now it's all like working in reverse. It's like you're building up to the the big album rather than the album comes out and then it becomes big over time. Yeah, yeah. Although you still wish or you still hope for it to become, you know, classic over time. And it does kind of work like that. But the stuff that's sure. really going to get pushed is what comes out before the release and, and what you put a lot of emphasis into. So. Right. I think that we have a, a, just a unique time in music. Like when I, I remember when Sun Eater came out, I put this little short little diatribe out about, uh, you know, somebody reposted it as, as, you know, me lamenting the death of physical uh, albums, you know, <laughs> but I was just like, there's just something about like having it in your hands, you know, when we, when we first get oh, yeah. the copy and like, that was such an important part of growing up for me um, was going to the record store, going to the CD store and I would ride my bike there. And like, that was a thing to do. And I would, you know, they'd have used CDs or demos of the newer stuff and you would listen to it. And like, sometimes you would buy stuff just cause the, the album art or whatever. And you come home and like, it was like an experience in and of itself to listen to music as something to do, not as a background. Um, Absolutely. like, uh, Vic, Vic Wooten has this book, um, two books that are really good. One of them is called, uh, the music lesson. And the second one's called the spirit of music. And, um, he goes into the, one of his really sort of unique concept that, that, you know, if you were to take music, and say like if you wanted to hear music 100 years ago you had to either play it yourself or go to somebody else and have them play it for you there was no recorded format so we were getting a hundred percent of um the emotion you know the the actual you know psychoacoustic properties like all the frequency band it was all real and then like with each new advent in technology we're sort of like chopping that down to the point now where like you know, everything's quantized, everything's to the grid, all vocals are auto-tuned to the fact that even if we go back and listen to like the stuff I grew up on, like, like you know, even Nirvana, listening to uh, Kurt Cobain and like the, the Unplugged record and you're like, oh man, he was really pitchy. And you're like, I never thought that before. It's just because our ears are now so tuned to have that, that wavelength of the, of the, you know, of a or whatever it is yeah, yeah. so perfectly gridded out that there's the humanities missing from it. And like, I think that that's, you know, potentially the one argument he makes is that could be leading into part of the reason why music is sort of dying as being in and of itself an activity that you can do and share with your friends uh, as opposed to being background music. Like yeah, some, yeah. I put it on in the car when I'm driving someplace, I put it on at the gym, but I don't sit down and listen to music as something to do in and of itself. And I think like our generation is like maybe the one of the last ones that are going to do in that. Maybe there's some kids out there that'll, that'll, yeah. that it will, it will resonate with, but. Yeah. I mean, I think that the pendulum swings both ways. So like with all of this TikTok stuff going on right now, where it's the short, the song, the great song shortening, like everything has to fit into this viral clip. If you really want it to take off, it's, there's got to be a viral clip to it. But I do think that that will, or I hope that that will breed people who want to hear full pieces of art. True. So, I mean, that's what I hope. I think so. I mean, I can't, I can't speak. I mean, when's the last time you get, I mean, maybe you guys, maybe, but I can't remember the last time I bought a CD and like, 
get, you know what I mean? And like, who's got, is there a CD player rec- in your car? I buy records though. See, that is the thing. I feel like a lot of people are buying vinyl now and vinyl, you know this because JFAC probably has like five variants or you know, 10 variants out right now. Vinyl does sell it doesn't sell as well as CDs or, you know, as stuff you used to sell back in the day, but vinyl does do pretty well. That's something. True. So I, th- I think that there is something there, but you know, you can't take it in your car where Spotify and all of that <laughs> stuff is, I use Spotify all the time. You know, it's gr- It works well for me, but there is also, you are supporting people in that Spotify thing. You know, when you, when people have Spotify listeners, if, when the industry is talking about bands, they are immediately talking about how many listeners do they have on Spotify? And, right. you know, that determines a lot of stuff now. So, but yeah, I, I, I do think that since vinyl has come back into style, I feel like maybe CDs will come back into style, maybe physical copies in some way. I remember people used to have like, flash drives for a while people were trying to make yep. flash drives happen yeah. you know that was they whack. never really took that off was whack. yeah did you guys ever have a mini disc player uh, no no I, I remember it uh and i wanted one my friend had one mini and i actually hot. remember for a little while Pete, they labels were making mini discs yeah really? there yep. was ha- uh like a michael jackson one or something oh okay. yeah yeah dangerous yeah yep. and then uh i had I still have it. I wonder if it's worth some money, but I have uh, Evil Empire from Rage in the, okay. the little okay. mini disc thing. And yeah, yeah, there was it, they were fucking awesome. They were really great. And yeah. like I got into those right when I started getting into like recording myself right when I was fifteen, sixteen, and it was so cool. It was like I'd come out of a little Behringer, you know, sixteen oh four little eight channel mixer and just go RCA out into the RCA in of a mini disc player, and then I had a CD burner, and that's how I'd add. Tra- layers to the tracks and be like, all right, here's drums and guitars, and then play back yeah. the mini disc and then rip it to a CD. And go back yeah, and yeah. Now that's something I don't know if we'll ever go back to. Yeah. You know, that's that's a relic of the. See, past. I like Pro Tools more than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I probably would have written, been able to write a lot cooler shit uh, yeah, back yeah. then if I if it wasn't limited to that. But it also made like you had to be better. Crafty. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you gotta be crafty. Now it's like you can record a note at a time. And make yeah, a fucking yeah. crazy sick record. Yeah. Oh, you, you know? totally can. For sure. So w- did you track yourself or did you go to Jason for? Yeah, went to Jason. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's like important for me. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't really like tracking myself for a couple yeah. of reasons. Um, one, I think the biggest one is just like the way my creative brain works is like, I need, I need somebody to hit the ball back. You know, like yeah. I got to like throw an idea out and then have somebody hit it back. And then like even just one, one uh, return of a serve and I'm good, you know, but like if it's just me against the wall, I'm like, is this fucking cool or does this suck? I have no idea. Um, which is, you know, I mean, sometimes, you know, but in general too, like Jason's such a unique musical mind that like th- those lines are, are, it's very important that, um, it, like they wouldn't come out the way that they did if, if I didn't track with him, you know, cause yeah, I'll be yeah. like, I'll have something. Right. And he'll be like, move that up a fret. And I'll be like, Oh shit, that's weird and really cool. You yeah, know? Yeah. Yeah. And that happens all the time. You know, yeah, like yeah. It, it's a major part of it. And did you experience that with the, with recording with him? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, um, yeah, he's such a cool musical, like madman. That, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> But honestly, he was pretty much, I, was, I kind of expected him to have a little more like notes for me or kind of like, oh, let's try sure. it like this or try it like that. But like everything I would do, he'd be like, wow, that was really sick. You know, or, or like <laughs> even encourage me to do it. Like uh, sometimes like when uh, I'm in the studio and like a riff's playing, I'll do something like just kind of as a joke, you know, like just something like really crazy. And he'd right. be like, oh, let's keep that. You know, so it was like, uh, he was like more, uh, it, it feels like recording with someone that's like excited about music with him. You know? Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. It's it, like it really free, difference. like an open, you know, he's not like really thinking about anything other than just like making it sick. You know, he's not like, all right, we need to, ha-, you know, do it. He's not thinking about like if it's going to be commercial or not. Right. You know, yeah. He's just like yeah, making it true. cool, you know, for the art's sake. He does go back and like, he'll, he'll listen back through though. And like, at like the weirdest times, you know, he, he's got a crazy like night type yeah. schedule like I do. Yep. So you need to get those like 3am, 4am zoom call or, you know, 
Skype calls from him. Yeah, yeah. But um, and it will just be in there recording, and he would just, you know, it's like four a.m. and he's just in there listening, just jaking out, as he would call it. And he's, <laughs> I, I got to redo the snare. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like, dude, it's good, yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. Like, no, yeah, he some was some little thing I'll hear, and like he he like can't let it go. It's I'm kind of similar that way, where like my whole house could be a wreck, but if if I have one blind that's turned. Like I gotta fucking fix it. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, Trent. Yeah, Steve. Uh, Steve Davis calls it a, a disease. He's like, you guys yeah. have a disease. Something yeah, it's wrong the, with you guys. The disease of the artist. Yeah. He's like, well, I'm I in mean, the studio and I can't hear the fucking difference. You're doing it a hundred different times. <laughs> it doesn't sound different to me at all. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's that's that whole thing, and maybe I think a lot of artists can can uh, vibe with this, but it's a record's never done. It's never yeah. finished. 100 just turn it. You just turn it in. Yep. Yeah. You have to just be like, okay, we're done You're like, working on this. <laughs> All right. We're stopping here. <laughs> yeah. There are uh-huh. a million more things that you could do. If, if yeah. I could work on a record for the rest of my life, there'd be one and it would come out after I died because that's <laughs> what you know. <laughs> but just because that's there are constantly dude. things that you hear. I mean, there is a point where you go through and there you don't hear anything that stands out. Like that's what I listen for in mixes. If I go through and there's nothing that's like right there, like, Oh, this needs to come down. That layer needs to go up. Then I feel like a mix is finished, but, and I can come to that, but I could work on it forever and yeah. ever. It's kind of a cool idea for like a concept record. Just like this. It's a record that you write your entire life and it doesn't come out until <laughs> after you die. It really is. Or maybe it comes out <laughs> and then a new version comes out every year so. <laughs> really like, it's like a la sagrada familia you know it's like it's just i don't want this record to come out till 2150 so somebody's got to take the bill running with it their whole lives uh, you know, if i had kids but never I have cats and they can't record so yeah yeah true so how long were you uh with jason uh we never really were officially together as like a couple, but <laughs> I mean, there was like a little bit where I thought we might've been, but um, we, uh, I think I was down there about 10 days too. I, we had to extend it too. Cause it was like, and we still didn't get everything done that I wanted to get done. I did have to actually record a couple pieces, um, myself, okay. um, okay. after afterwards at home. Cause, and, and after having already extended, you know, my stay like another three days, cause we, I mean, we, we spent three days getting the right strings. Okay. Is wow. that true? Yeah. Are you well, just are you just fair, joking because like, of the tones part? <laughs> no, it was the tones thing. And to be fair, like we, you know, it was like we knew once we figured out what the ones that we actually wanted, we had to wait to order because we had to order more of that. It was just like a 125, and the packs don't come that way, so we had to like get an overnight from Dario. Okay. And but yeah, it was like I didn't start recording to like the third day, so okay. then that added into the end of it. But the 125 does sound better than the 130. So, you know, yep. what can is that true? Do? Would I be able to tell the difference if I heard it? No, no. Yeah. Not at all. Right? <laughs> That's just some weird. I mean, how often do you change your strings? Uh, I would love to do it like every 30 minutes if I could. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. I know, right? Travis used to change his guitar strings every single day. And I was like, this, this dude's crazy. That's a yeah. lot. If I had a tech, it would be every day, It'd be like every day. Yeah. I mean, I, I really acidic hands though. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and I think like I try to put everything I have into every show, and usually that means that you're sweating your ass off, True. and that extra sweat, like they're, they're, they're kind of shot after one yeah, after one yeah. show. You know, yeah. it's like a half hour set, probably be okay with two days, but if it's a full hour set, I'm like, yeah, I would love the next day. You're like, they sound like cardboard. You know, sound like a fucking yeah, yeah. oh yeah. With bass, band. it's really really noticeable. I mean, yeah, with well, guitar, especially too, with how but, loud yeah. Nick's bass is on the album, That's you true. might you might be able to tell. Yeah. Yeah, no. Oh yeah, Go we would change strings in the middle of a song. Sometimes, you you would hear it. And you'd be like, if, if you're riding on that the the low A in a lot of the case in this one, it would be like, if there's a bunch of the song has that, then like at, you know, seventy five percent of the way through, you're like, check it. Now go back and listen to the beginning of the song. You're like, oh fuck, yeah, change it. <laughs> you know, you're like, shit. Yeah. But yeah it's it's it is it if you're gonna be that loud in the mix though it, that is that is probably key i mean for a lot of bands it probably wouldn't matter and bass strings are fucking expensive yeah you know yeah. what i mean like it's it's brutal it's like they're five times the cost of guitar strings so for cats out there that don't have an endorsement it's just like uh yeah. you just gotta kind of make it work i do have an idea actually for uh somebody already did it and i'm probably not gonna give this away but whatever like <laughs> i think somebody actually already did it. i think jst already did it but um Take your strings, right? Record, you know, fresh strings. Record, intonate it 
record a, a thing, right? Then play them dead and then re-record it, right? And then do a, uh, you know, an RTA frequency analysis of the difference playing the exact same thing. And then just apply that freak, you know, apply that and it'll give you like a little new string EQ. Okay. Yeah. And then put it in a pedal. There you go. The new string pedal. That's <laughs> yeah. a good idea. That would dude. sell so Damn. Yeah, that's a good Whoa. ass idea. That would do really well. Well, I learned Don't that bass strings are... That. Uh, we have it right here. We've got the copyright right here. Yeah. We have it on video. It I belongs learned that to Nick. Bass strings are so expensive because companies don't sell as many bass strings. So yeah. Supply I mean, there's, you know, Evan does not like new strings. Yeah, yeah. Evan would be like, nah. It's gotta be on. They gotta be on the base at least three three weeks before I like them. <laughs> I was like, no really shit. that much? Really? Yeah. He says, "We tell me, dude." Uh, well, I yeah, wonder he's, why. A, he's a unique cat, you know. Yeah, that's definitely. very true. I, he, his, I, you know, something maybe about like incorporating that much double thumb yeah, into yeah. something ah. like the fresh. Can you know maybe for him it it, it bites too much in the way mm-hmm. his EQ is set up and the way he plays and stuff. But um, yeah, new that that first like. 20 minutes with new strings though it's the best i know it's it's, like th- there are better ideas that come out then you know <laughs> it's all about that i mean i don't play bass but i even know what you're talking about like just the feel i'm kind of surprised like, you don't to be yeah. honest i i kind of do i'm pretty sick at it <laughs> i bet you are with nothing you know how are your vocals though? that's what i'm his vocals uh, are kind of decent I, I, honestly really? yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not I, tra- I tried for a while to I'm talk him into doing backing vocals but we solved it in other ways I'm having some. You're gonna, do the, do you're gonna get the vocals. headset and do the Morgan <laughs> Rose thing. No, I'm not oh. gonna do it. <laughs> that would be so embarrassing. <laughs> like bass is like only fun if you have like a really sick bass. Otherwise, it's just not really fun, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I like all basses, but yeah, when you when you have one that's set up and tricked out, like oh, it's like it's like having power steering. It's so is the way I put it. Yeah, like Mark yeah, has the um the like Alex Webster bass. Is that MTD? Spectre for Spectre. Alex Webster. Yeah, Spectre. He has that signature bass and i borrowed it from him to record on something and man it was like so fun to play it was yeah the shit dude. yeah the thing rips well so what specters are sick <clears throat> what's the best bass to play well i don't know depends on who you ask what's the number I mean, one bass i'm asking nick i think um <laughs> yeah no. for me like it's mtd for me it's like Evan I, played, it's like Evan any, any of those bases you, that are like ten thousand dollars yeah are yeah. gonna for the most part be the shit you know yeah. um <laughs> Foderas are incredible. I got to play Victor Wooten's Foderas, like almost all of them. And they're just like, it's just, I got to play a Carl Thompson in Japan, the, the Claypool bases, and just like fucking amazing. Ritters, the German bass company, but those are like, you can spend 50 grand on one. Jesus. Um, what? Yeah, it's fucking gnarly. Well, we were dude. just talking like, about that before you got on. Like, so you do think that the more expensive an instrument is, the better that it is to play? Uh, not itself. always the case. No, uh-uh. okay. I've got some bases that were like list price 20 grand and they're nowhere near as good as the stock you wow. know, $6,000 one. Yeah. 6,000 is mean, a lot though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 6,000 is a lot. Cheap, yeah. cheap, so like, that's, the cheap that's the cheap one. base. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, yeah. I mean, I, there's a company called Sire and uh, Marcus Miller works with those guys. And like his whole idea was that like it shouldn't, it shouldn't be like ma- maple's maple, you know, uh, a decent set of pickups and, um, you know, a quality build shouldn't, shouldn't be thousands of dollars. You should for $500, you should be able to make a really great sounding instrument. And the sires are great, you know? Um, so I think that it's, it, it really depends. And it's also about comfort. You know what I mean? Like mm. if for me, like a lot of techniques that I use, um, you want like the string to body ratio to be real slim. So where this, like where the body of the bass is and where the strings are right where your hand plays or slaps like thinner, less space in between there. So that for the economy of motion, so that your thumb doesn't go all the way underneath the string and get caught. Uh, okay. You want less so that your thumb can't even go under it. And then you can get to, it's just much easier. It's like, it's like power steering. So it's also like bumper lanes when you're bowling. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's, fucking, that's the way I equate it. You know, it's like, it just makes it, it just keeps you in the, in, in the right spot, you know? And so there's generally, I found like it takes, you know, a little more than a G ish. I've never really found a base that has that type of a setup under a thousand bucks, but there's no reason it couldn't, you know, maybe we should do that. Let's get Tosin to do it. Yeah. yeah I know. Right. I don't maybe think it, it would probably be the 20 grand model. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I asked him forever. They made one base. Oh, really? Oh, did they? 
yeah, he made one back and then like that was it. But you know what it was? I think it was one of those weirdo like four strings fretted, two strings fretless oh, type of yeah, deals. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, which is that's a that's a pretty niche product, you know what I mean? I know, that, totally. that, ain't, that makes me mad. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you angry. <laughs> Well, I have the, I have the idea to have a trim like a floating trim on a guitar, but it's only on the top three strings. Like I thought, I thought that'd be so cool because you don't really want to dive bomb the low strings anyway, and then they would always stay in tune. But how so. would you play that Motley Crue riff? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you couldn't play that one Motley. <laughs> That's Crue the riff, one riff but, you could yeah. not play. Band John Five can't do it. Man. <laughs> he needs that fucking. <laughs> so I wanted to when did you join Job for a Cowboy? 2011. So January. it was wow. before what was the record right before Sun Eater? Uh there was Demonocracy right, and then Demonocracy. the v- very first thing I did was Gloom. The EP, there was an EP called Gloom. Doom really? And Gloom. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's good. So well <laughs> listening to them today I'm like obviously there is an audible shift in bass. Like the bass <laughs> comes up in the mix on Sun Eater. It's way more prominent on sun eater what was the decision behind that so we were at jason's mm-hmm. and we were um i think guitar uh drums had just gotten done danny had just finished his drums or was like on the last day and um or it might even have been guitars uh, either way i hadn't gone yet and like i was kind of like because ah. when you go in with producers and bass playing there's always like um a little bit of that fight there's a battle to be able to want to to be present in the mix the way that I am, the way that I like to be. But that's what made me want to play bass. You know, like I I was a guitar player, vocalist, you know, my whole life growing up till I was 18. And then my drummer who we taught each other how to play his kid, Greg Williams, um, shows up one day, we get super baked and he had, he had the Mudvayne LD 50 CD and we listened to it. And it was like, I forget where we were going, but we were like, we have to finish this record. And it was just, it just blew my mind that I was like, oh, I mean, I grew up on Flea and Les Claypool and cats like that. And I'm like, yeah, the fucking sweet bass, slap bass, whatever. But it wasn't in like in the context of, you know, a technical metal type of a situation yeah. of where the bass could be, you know, sort of like the main motif. They were kind yeah, of yeah. switched roles in that band. It was like Greg, the guitar player was, more of what a, a, a bassist would do, you know, real kind of rhythmic and holding a pattern down. And then the bassist was like, you know, playing all this crazy stuff and just the timbre of the instrument was so, it was just flattering to my ears, you know? And so anyways, we were in there and uh, I remember not being stoked on the tones of the previous two recordings with JFAC that I had done, the, the Demonocracy and um, Gloom. Cause like I was putting Sans Amp on it. This was before Dark Glass. Yeah. And I was just like, I, it just it's not my I, I like the fucking way the bass sound like it's a really yeah, yeah. nice killer expensive ass bass that sounds amazing and beautiful and i think when you're putting it through this distort distortion things there's this like somewhere in the low mids that just gets sucked in and compressed and like yeah. fit inside the guitar pocket you know yeah, yeah. yeah. and totally. yeah and so i remember talking to johnny about it and he's like dude pump pump for the bass and i was just like yeah, you know, he's gonna make it, we're gonna have to put Sands amp on it, I'm sure. <laughs> he was like, What's your favorite bass tone of all time? And I was like, LD fifty. And he was like, You serious? And I thought he was gonna like make fun of me because Mudvayne was kind of new metal, you know, yeah, yeah. whatever. And he's like, No, that's my favorite bass tone. And I was like, Shut the what the fuck are we doing? Yeah, you know? Yeah. So that was it. So then like once Johnny was cool with it, we call it going for the honk, that like honky mid range. Yeah. Um yeah. But he's like, once once Johnny was cool with it, it was like, okay, that's happening. I remember actually, Sukov had to send a little clip of it to the label and see if they were okay with it. Whoa. Yeah. And they, and they were like, that's fucking sweet. Oh, yeah, dude. It's awesome. I love it. I yeah. love how much the bass has stuck out on these last two records. And this, Thank you. the listening to the latest one, I just feel like it's an even more concise version of Sun. Like, it's kind yeah. of... It's got a lot of the ideas of Sun Eater, but you guys are just going honing more and more what I think of as being the the JFAC sound now. Like that, I know that John for a Cowboy gets associated a lot with being a deathcore band because of the you know entombment. Everyone knows entombment and stuff, but really JFAC has been a death metal band the whole time, and you guys have just kind of honed more into like this awesome, creative, unique sound that N- Naveen uh, said that it sounded kind of, that it was kind of like Mastodon. You know, there's like that kind of chordal yeah. guitar 
Uh, it's kind of arpeggiated, almost like banjo-y yeah. kind of yeah. riffs. Yeah, I don't know how to explain sure. it, actually. but yeah, I know exactly what you're like, talking about, yeah, though. Yeah, it's like that. Yeah, yeah. But then it's still kind of a death metal vibe, obviously, with the crazy yeah. drums and everything and vocals. There's some that have, like, real specific with that, like uh, Gwen, uh, Into the Crystalline Crypts. But, like, some of the parts, I don't know, is like, oh, man, he's got that. It's, you know, a lot of, the, I think some of that influence is coming from Tony really getting into other guitar players outside of the metal world. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. He's big into like a lot of crazy stuff that you wouldn't think that, you know, shred metal guitarists would listen to like, like Danny Gatton and uh, Tony Rice and um, even fight like fucking John Schofield. Like the, all these like other players are getting into. So they have a lot of those, like it's chicken pickings, what they called it. Yeah. 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 Totally. And, and, and Nashville way down that yeah, way. Yeah. Uh, but you know, that hy- hybrid picking. So, so he's doing picking, stuff like that for those riffs. Yeah. There's Matt, there's tons of hybrid picking. Oh, that's really yeah, cool. Like all kinds of shit all over there. And so you kind of, I think it kind of lends itself more to that almost like t- twangy, almost kind of banjo esque yeah. riffs. Yeah. And then you, you distort it and it's like, Oh, it's, it's Mastodon, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's yeah, kind of totally. like the fucking pick scrape. The backwards pick scrape is, Oh, there's Gojira, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's yeah. like you, somebody kind of owns it. You know, the fourth <laughs> harmony, the fourth or fifth harmony is like, oh, it's Allison Chains, you know? <laughs> right, 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 right. Totally. Yeah. I, it's fucking awesome. Are you guys like Thank you. working on, do you think that there will be a next record after this? Yeah. I've got songs already. That's Tony's awesome. already sent at least one and it's weird. And he's going, it's like, it's going to be like the weird stuff on, I don't know, weird or whatever, the moody shit mm. um, that's on the record, the stuff that's not like your kind of standard traditional I guess even JFAC death metal stuff, all that other stuff. It's we're going to dive probably pretty deep into that stuff. Cause like the metal shit's always going to be there. It's always going to yeah, come yeah. out, you know, it's put Johnny, you know, Johnny's vocals on it or whatever. It's like after that essence is sort of defined in yourself, it's really like, okay, what, do, you know, experimentation, I think is a big part of it. And uh, I'm all for that. I mean, he was doing every, I think this song's on a six string strat tuned to fucking E. So I'm like, Oh wow. All right. <laughs> this could be interesting. You know, that's, that's going to cool. be really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. I'm excited to hear that. But you are right. It's like at the end of it, that that essence of the metal essence, the job for a cowboy thing is always there. And that is something like I haven't gone through and listened to every JFAC record ever. I've, I've never done that. So going and listening to all of that, I was like, this is such a logical like it's all very logical. None of it feels like it's that like a totally different band to me. It just feels like a band that's like completely honed in their old thing like you guys are coming into something really cool and i think whatever you do next is going to be fucking awesome and like more of that direction so thank you i think there's something to it where for sun eater specifically i remember being on the mayhem tour the last like tour that we did in 2013 um and uh we were deciding like we were talking about what the next record was going to be and we were basically like let's fucking do whatever the fuck we want and not care about anything or anybody. Yeah. Yeah. And like there was this concept um, that was kind of floating around about this, this person very close to the band. And um, we were like, let's, let's make that record, you know, like let's fucking do that. And like, let's have futuristic tones and, and you know, all this, like just stuff that we were almost throwing out, not quite as a joke, but just like, you know, kind of just like, willy nilly throwing things yeah, out yeah. And we're like, God, that, that actually be really cool and so we decided to make it and it fucking worked because it was something that we all wanted to do without with zero regard for what anybody else would care any doom fans or any of the you know the post doom fans or label or fucking anybody and i think that there's a it's that 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 rick rubin book the the creative act i don't know if you guys have delved into that yet but it's really good um and he he's got that thing in where he's like the audience should come last yeah you know it should be what you want first and then like the cunts the circle's complete if people like what you did then you'll know that it's like when somebody loves you for you yeah you know? absolutely. instead of who who you want them to be or who they want you to be you know and i think that that requires some sort of trust and experimentation and that kind of stuff and sometimes you don't always win and they might be like oh, I'm, not, I'm not india but at least it's honest and it's real yeah, yeah. you know and i think that's more important that's very true uh, this seems to be a recurring theme in like conversations that i've had lately just that authenticity and i think that when you are your most authentic self making music making art that is honestly when you open yourself the most for other people to relate to what you're creating because if you're doing something that's from your heart then other people 
will catch on to that. Like yeah. it, it's super obvious. People can smell I it. Agree. They yeah. can smell if it's honest or not. Even if it's trying, even if it's something that blows up and it's like super popular or whatever, like the people who made that thing that is popular, they meant it. They weren't just doing it to do it, to try to get big. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. I think that's about, I mean, I guess just in our, in your everyday life, you know what I mean? When any of your relationships and anything, any kind of business relationships, interpersonal relationships, whatever, like if you're your authentic self and then people love you for it, you know, then, then the, it's the cycles complete, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and like the, uh, the value is there and the, and the authenticity of the connection is real too, you Absolutely. know, and it, and it requires vulnerability. Because if you're being on, you know, you're putting yourself out honestly. I mean, like, I, I've always been a fan of of your ability to do that, Naveen. Like, I mean, you always followed your heart, you Thank know, you. and true. like the 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 Naveen K stuff. You know what I mean? And like pushing super hard. It was just fucking cool to see. Like, oh shit, he's going for it. That's what he's into. It's what he wants yeah, to do. Yeah. You know, stepping down from the animals gig to to pursue something that like was your passion. You know, yeah. at the time. So I think that that's that's a mark of a of a true artist in Thank my you, opinion man. yeah of course yeah i mean people sometimes ask me like oh how'd you get all these gigs? like because i've done like, i've got to work with like some good bands and people and stuff and they're like sometimes people ask right. me like oh how did you get that gig or how did you get that and i'm just like I'm just friends with them man you know <laughs> I, like i've never had the motive of like one day i'll get to play on jfax record or something you know what i mean it's just like <laughs> they asked me to do it uh, that's and that's been my whole entire life like i've never probably to my detriment you know i've probably never never uh networked really in that way i'm just friends with well, people it, it, it was organic yeah i yeah. did it the organic way i mean i remember staying at your guys's at the animal house back in uh like put after nam back like i guess 2012 2013 yeah or whatever and i remember actually <laughs> listening to the the jfac hadn't come out demonocracy hadn't come out and we went and listened to it in your guys's room and oh uh, all the way back then, you know, and just like even with, when, when, because I didn't even know that Chaney was a singer back then, you guys were talking about doing something, and I was like, oh shit, no way. And to watch that progression is yeah. just fucking incredible, you know. Thanks, you guys are, are, are very inspirational, you know. It's, <laughs> Thanks, it's, Thanks, it's, it's, it's hard to put in the level of work into this industry that is required to like get success with it. Some people maybe, maybe have the overnight thing. I, I don't yeah, know, yeah. but I, I do know that like from my perspective, seeing people that achieve the, the level of success that you guys had, but like fucking you guys earned it. You know what I mean? Thank like you. you guys are always fucking doing something. Thank you. Um, always working on something, always grinding and pushing. And it's, it's cool to see. And it, it's just like a Testament to, I think people coming up, you know, that it's like, if, if, you know, it's not, easy and yeah it's gonna yeah. be a lot of fucking work but if you bust your ass and persevere like it, it, you know think good things can happen you know success can come you know that, but that's why you have to always be honest with yourself and do the type of music that you just want to do anyway yeah. because then to me it is kind of easy in a way because i'm just doing what i'd probably probably i mean what else would i do you know that's, <laughs> <laughs> Like, You'd probably be successful at a lot. You got to do yeah. something. So I like doing that. I'm going to do it like whatever, you know, it's not. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, I told this, I tell this to everybody like Chaney and I talk about it. It's like, even if, if you make the music that you like to make, even if no one else listens to it, at least you'll have the satisfaction of like, I created this cool thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Do you guys have any, uh, okay. So here's a question for you. Do you guys have any songs? You're so busy with the Entheo st stuff all the fucking time, but do you have any songs that you guys make either together or individually that are completely not in metal at all? Yeah, like we have, we have this one that we made and it's kind of like electronic rock. Yeah, it definitely is. But I'm like, oh. dude, we have to use it because it's like so good. And we made it like five years ago. Yeah. Oh shit! And my mom heard it and was like, "That's the best." She's like, song. "That's the hit. The it's best the mom, song you guys have ever hit. made." I also, yeah. I'm like, "Dude, we have to use this. It's so <laughs> sick." But yeah, it's like, I don't really even know how to explain what it would be. But yeah, I think as the band, the has, world needs man. Kind of as right the now. as like the band has kind of progressed and we've got a little more like diverse. It's like I think we could almost pull it off. Like yeah, that. I don't, I don't see for CR band always only putting out metal tracks. Yeah. Like that's not really that's not how I see our band. Yeah, I see us. Um, 
you know, we've con- we've gone kind of into the rock territory. I could see us doing a track that was just like some some Euro rack synth, like industrial kind yeah, of yeah, industrial thing type stuff. Oh no uh, shit! Yeah, no, I could definitely sure. see us doing that. Yeah. I've I've like, also like, some, like Nin or something or yeah, dude, yeah. for sure. Yeah, we're Precisely. definitely heavy. Lock, like yeah. right now, we're listening to a lot of like Marilyn Manson and Ramstein and shit like Tons that. And we're like, Manson. dude, we need to make some shit like this. <laughs> yeah, it's like Nin meets Drake. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, probably get him on a track. <laughs> Shit, I know, dude. Right? That'd be sick. I've also been working on this. Like, uh, do you know? Are you familiar with the knife? No, huh? Okay, so it's kind of like a danceable, like a dance goth type project that I've been working on. What's on her, my other, own. her other thing? Uh, Fever Ray. Are you familiar with Fever Ray? You would probably no, huh? like both of these okay. things. You should check them out. Uh, two of okay. my favorite projects of all time. But so I'm also kind of working on that, and that's just all singing, no screaming. Just cool. dancing, danceable, you know, goth night tracks. But yeah, I know a bar in Denver you can play, dude. There you go. It's, it's like a big club, but it's it's called Milk, and it's like this massive, like pretty much goth everything. But there's like five. It's kind of like a European club. You oh, know how like precisely. when we go over there and play, and it'll be like, oh, got to get off stage right now because this is turning into a you know Euro dance party. Uh, you're like, yeah. you have like yeah. All the different levels and different, and it's like, oh, here's the '80s room, here's the goth room. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like that, but I feel like uh, you get, you should play there with that. Then oh, that would be awesome. Uh, do you have <laughs> anything like that? Do you have anything that's not? Um, yeah, I I have uh, actually a bunch of stuff that I've been. I just write. I have like most of shit when I sit down on my computer, and or, or just play bass or whatever is like not any would fit in no uh, none of my bands, <laughs> um, and like especially when I write stuff because um, I love singing and um like sing singing and uh i've always sang that was like my kind of my first instrument like when i was two three years old i was just and like i do it subconsciously like when i'm i don't even know that i'm doing my, but my mom and my and alicia will be like yeah you sing like whenever you're going in and out of the bathroom whenever you're entering or leaving a building whenever you're getting in or out of a car like i don't even know that i'm doing it but um anyways it's it's kind of like real s- similar to uh i guess like the stuff that i grew up with with my parents you know, when I was real young. So like a lot of the eighties stuff, like Genesis and like, you know, Phil Collins, Steve Winwood, um, sting shit like that. And I've written a couple of the songs and, and I got probably like seven or eight of them. And again, same thing. I show my parents and they're like, this is what you should be doing. <laughs> yeah, I know. Up the metal. It's the metal has been great, but this is the real, yeah, you, yeah. Know? you know what I've realized though? A lot of the, t- sometimes the parents are kind of right. Like d- don't be. give up the metal, but also do the other thing yeah. because the right? other thing, do you think that you'll put it out as like a solo project or I would like to. Yeah. Um, but that's my thing is like, I kind of have that, the perfectionist thing where I'm like, if I'm going to do it, I need to go to Sukhoff or Otero or oh, somebody yeah. and like fucking actually do it right. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I should just get over that. Cause it's like, I think that people care less about quality than I think they do that. They yeah, do, yeah. you know, like so many times people are like, dude, you can make cell phone videos now. People don't care. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I recorded with my buddy Kyle track. and we, what's that? I said, don't let it hold you back. It's like, you know, you want to make something that sounds awesome, but like just if it means that you're not going to put it out, then, be- oh yeah because you can make something that sounds pretty fucking awesome on your own you know that's true that's true yeah i mean and how i don't anybody get good you know they just you know otero didn't go to audio engineering school he just fucking started recording so yeah. fall like in the you know, yeah. logo and it was like yeah that that's one side of it you think about and it's a little interesting i think you know maybe naveen you could speak to that like when you dropped the naveen k stuff did you have any like reservations about like oh if i put this up on my page where people know me for metal that they're gonna be like what the fuck is this shit you know yeah um i i didn't at the time uh i would now though (laughs) 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 at the time i was like 24 and i didn't fucking care about anything so i was like fuck everybody i don't care but now i'm like Oh, I gotta make sure things are cohesive over here, you know. <laughs> right, right. Uh, You're gonna lose I think, some subs. You're gonna uh, lose a lot of followers. You yeah, post up some weird shit. Soft yeah. brand shit's not good, man. Yeah, honestly, um, I, I've like posted some clips of like electronic music just like a couple times over the years, and like people are way into it. I, I think yeah. it's not as like people now because this is ten years later. Like they're just like way more open to all types of music. Like at the time, I was like. Yeah, I'm quitting animals to like go make dubstep. That was like the that was like saying that you're gonna like vote for Trump or something like that. You know what I mean? It was like just a socially unacceptable thing to do in in music in metal. 
you know? It was so, sick. Yeah. It was ballsy. It was ballsy. It was yeah. ballsy. But now it's like, I, I think people just think that's kind of cool. Or they have like electronic music that they like a lot. And then a lot of metal people are into the whole like synth wave thing or whatever it's called. Well, sure. Well, I'll also say from the outside looking in as a fan of both of you guys that I don't think that people only look to you for metal. Like yeah. Nick, mm. you've got this whole like whimsical like musical thing going on and Naveen's got you know what I mean though you know exactly what I mean it's like when I see your video I love it (laughs) it's like it's like the best way I can explain it but like the the playthroughs that you put up it's never we're never getting like a normal Nick playthrough you know it's like it's true it's hella creative and crazy and I I don't know that people turn to you guys and think Oh, it's strictly tech death or it's strictly yeah. brutal death metal or something. You know, yeah. I think that you've both carved these cool careers out for yourselves where you're known as being people who are like multifaceted and can do a bunch of different things. And people would love to see those kind of releases from you. Uh, well, yeah, I yeah. mean, go ahead. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think more at the time I was like, uh, I want, I had more to prove. Like I wanted to prove that I could do something other than play drums in a band. Whereas now I, I I just, I don't know. I don't really feel like I have that to prove. I would just like, I would just say, Hey, I made some electronic music. Check it out. You know, I wouldn't be like, this is my thing now. Like, you know, (laughs) know, I've decided to switch. I've decided to, you know, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. 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 I would like just say, Hey, here's some stuff I made. And I, and I really want to do that. I mean, I think about doing that a lot. Um, but it's just well, dude, that drum thing that you did in New York that was fucking nuts. Thank oh, you, man. That was so Thank cool. That was, th- there's yeah. a video coming That's out of that. That's some crazy like, shit. We have a really, really sick video of the whole set, and yeah. uh, it's going to come out pretty soon. Well, I mean, I think. When, when you guys decided to put cleans, was there a similar thing? Were you uh, apprehensive about it at all? Or dude, were you like, I had a phone call with Steve. Steve Davis had to talk me off of a ledge. I was really? like, were you I be was like, pull like, it. Pull it. <laughs> I was like, well, c- they wanted it as the single that announced our album. And I was mm. like, well, I was on a phone call with Steve. Like, are we making the wrong fucking decision? Like we're putting it. I don't know if this is a, g- it's a rock song. Like yeah. it's not, you know, so I kind of freaked out. Um, yeah, I was scared about it until an hour after it came out, two hours after it came out. And there were some Whenever good like, comments on shit. it. They were like, yeah, it's our biggest like, song of ever by far. Yeah, I mean, the plays on our <laughs> Spotify, like double or quadruple every other song, you know. So it's it's so been okay in the long run. But before it happened, I was super, I was the most nervous. Naveen has way more of a like not what giving are, a fuck attitude. Yeah, whatever, dude. Whatever. Yeah, he doesn't to give a, he, he truly is someone that I know who doesn't give a fuck and I give some fucks, you know? Like, <laughs> it was a, so I was kind of a- apprehensive about it, but I always wanted to do it. Like, that is who I actually am. I actually am a person who sings in a band. Like, I, yeah. I haven't wanted to just scream ever. Yeah. It just was a matter of like having, when it made sense to put it in. So yeah, exactly. And that's, that's like, it kind of circles back to what we were talking about with like vulnerability. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's ultra, like p- putting clean singing. It's like, I would be so much less uh, apprehensive about putting any type of like rando esque vocal out there. Um, anything, you know, from you know, fry stuff, false chord, any, any of the like more extreme techniques or whatever, um, or just yelling kind of Slayer style, whatever, then clean vocals clean vocals are like the the most vulnerable musical expression i think that you can make yeah. um it's i mean it's the oldest instrument on the planet right yeah. at least oldest human instrument anyways i don't know if i guess birds sing but um but <laughs> yeah like i think that 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 that's part of like oh you put yourself out there you, you make yourself super vulnerable even up to like hours before the shit's gonna drop yeah and then like you get all this love and then all of a sudden it's like, oh shit. Okay. I should have been doing this a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It was a, there was a huge breath sigh of relief after that. But now yeah. it's, you know, the, the well has been, it's been unlocked. Like now I'm like, all right, I'm putting singing on. I hope you're ready for some singing. <laughs> then, if you like that. Yeah. then we're going to get Naveen doing harmony. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. no. Kar- uh, what's your karaoke jam, Janie? Mine is always screaming. And it's because, really? yeah, it's because I know that if I go, we just talked about this on the yeah, last Lamb podcast. I know that if I go in there with a screaming karaoke song, that You're like, win everybody. dude, ever, uh, you know, I'm like amazing people. Some of the okay. People so you win them the over room. with Lamb of God. 
yeah. then then what's the what's the singing what's the second yeah. like go to yeah, singing, do a singing well group. i would see i would do something that's a little more like avant-garde like chelsea wolfer marissa nadler type stuff but i have been singing a lot of uh sound garden fourth of july i think that's my next Dude, uh, i've been wanting to cover that song one. like so fall like supposed to do a cover record um i think it was like we're supposed to start it like 14 years ago, so we're a little behind the ball. But uh, but the, and everybody's like, you get two songs, and that was one of my picks. So oh, wow. damn! Fucking yeah. it's the best, one of the best songs. Oh, it's time. amazing! Awesome. It's such yeah. a good song. That's those are often my favorite kinds of songs. Like I really like <laughs> melancholic songs, like stuff that's dark and moody. That's when you're sad. You like just pour gas on the fire and just yep. precisely the saddest song you can. Precisely. So 100%. is Cephalic playing shows? Like what's going on with the band? Yeah. Um, you know, we keep getting like offer. I think that's part of the reason why new music never really comes out is because something will happen. We'll get an offer for something and then, oh, well, we haven't played in six months. So we need to, you know, prep to put on a good show. Mm -hmm. um, so the energy that would be spent into playing um, or writing new music will go into that. So it was one of those deals where, it's like, you know, Cavalera brothers will ask us to go out and we're like, okay, they're playing Arise and, and Beneath. So yeah, okay, we'll do that. Oh, wait, are and you then, doing that tour? What's that? Yeah. You're well, doing... they've done that tour like twice now, but yeah. There's another one happening though, right? Or it did Yeah, it they asked us to do it, but it was prude. It was like, I think I was like eight or nine weeks in the States and I was Holy like, I can't shit. do nine weeks in a van, dude. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> like, I can't. Yeah. I rough. mean, 41, it's, it's a little diff, that van bench, you know, with the fucking... <laughs> Springs. The like slight angle, yeah, yeah. They're never quite flat. <laughs> like, I'm just oh, it's brutal. Yeah, it's rough. But um, we did the decibel fast, decibel beer metal fast, and then like, um, there's some a, like a, there might be a Euro fest or two this year, um, and there's plenty of music out with that. Uh, it, like there's like an hour and a half written, but it's a drummer problem, man. Yeah. You know, mm, so yeah. you know, it's like John didn't want to do it. it. You know, said he wanted to do it, and then he didn't. And then it was like Patrice has been wanting to do it, and then we're like sending him tracks, sending him tracks. And then, you know, he's got a wood shipping business or something, a lumber company. So it's really difficult to get him to, to commit to like, you know, Hey, commit to writing these four songs. or like, let's book. I'm, I'm at the point now where I'm like, I don't think anything happens unless you book studio time, you know, yeah. unless uh, you're yeah. like a, a pro band like you guys. You know? uh, no, like, nothing. We don't, we have to book <laughs> Naveen. Yeah. Because that's when it all begins. If we don't have Naveen's studio time booked, we will never. Shit doesn't yeah, happen. Chilling. We're just learning to do it really far in advance now. Yeah, yeah. That's the only difference. We're like, just book it before you even have anything written. Yeah, exactly. we, that's we, what I'm we at. do I'm like, that. Just book it because that'll that'll provide the pressure. Yeah. they'd be like, we got we got to write. Okay, no Saturday we we have to get this done. Yeah, Otherwise, it's it's forever land. Yeah, you know? you'll never get it done. Well, so what do you think about this? I was kind of talking with Naveen about this earlier. Like, what do you think about the idea of getting material done quickly or working on it for 10 years? Do you, <laughs> do you think that it's better to like continuously write things, continuously put things out or to spend a lot of time on something and then put it out? Um, I think, I guess it just depends on everybody else's in the band's schedules and that kind of shit. You know, with JFAC, like, I, you know, everybody living in, a different state or a different country. Um, it's like the likelihood of something coming out in the next like two years is pretty low. Yeah. So, and with that, it's like, I guess it kind of ties back into like, we're talking about like, these are kind of more concept records, you know? And so um, those maybe should have a lot more time spent on them. And maybe it was a blessing that it took us that long to do it because those songs are so different from what they started out as Johnny and I were listening to the, to the tracks Um from going all the way back to 16, 17, 18. And like some of the songs are just fucking completely different, you know? Yeah. Naveen did something totally different, which made us be like, Oh, we need to, you know, yeah. shift all this up. And I think that that can be really, really cool. Um, but I also, you know, some, like some of those other tracks that I've t told you guys about that I write, like, like some, I'll write a whole track in like two hours. Yeah, like I'll yeah. just have the whole, the whole song just comes out. Yeah. And I feel like that's when you're really tapped into source or whatever yeah, you know absolutely like when 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 it just it's like you're a conduit and it's just flowing to you from the ether that's like i think where we all want to be but i don't know if you know tech death like happens that way yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like this whole tech death song just came to me in my dream like every single fret i know exactly <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to talk about the concept a little bit. So can you explain what the concept of Sun Eater and Moon Healer are? Yeah, for sure. Or is. Um, so like 2013, right? And um, we're on that Mayhem Fest and partying and having a great time. It really kind of reinvigorated the band because we had been doing a bunch of like, you know, we did some kind of more gnarlier tours. Like we were, we had just done Russia and it was brutal. Like Russia most brutal. Like Sprinter Van with like totally blown out struts oh, and man. the roads in Russia are not the sickest um, in between the long, long drives. And so we were dr- driving in between every show. It'd be like 14 to 16, 18 hour drives a day. And the the gas stations don't have how, how anything long were you but there gas. For? Um, we did so it was a whole fetus run for like five weeks or something, and then like twelve days in Russia. Wow! At Jesus. the end, at the end, we should have done it at the crazy. beginning. Crazy! Holy crap! It was brutal, and um, and so w- everybody was kind of just beaten down, you know. And doors were doing okay, but it wasn't like you know, Demon actually didn't hit that well, you know, because I think Tech Death back then, the environment wasn't as um receptive to like really really technical shit on a larger scale back then the way it is now you yeah. know like fucking uh, arch spire you yeah, know yeah. thousand cap 1200 cap rooms fucking yeah, sold yeah. out like people are way hungry and into tech death right now um back then it, it wasn't quite that um and so mayhem really reinvigorated us and it just gave us we were just like super stoked and really excited to go into the studio then and we had come up with this concept um where we had a, a, a very close friend of the band who had kind of had this just really insane life trajectory. They just, you couldn't like a, a movie about this would be fucking insane. You'd be like, who the fuck wrote this stranger than fiction, just going to all this crazy stuff. And they got really into hallucinogens and like, even like brewing their own hallucinogens and stuff. And they had all these like crazy sort of conspiracy esque um, perceptions about the world and all these different you know topics water and all this different shit and so we were like that'd be a fucking cool record we should write like a concept record like where each one of the songs is based off of these beliefs and uh and so that's kind of what what sun eater was and it was really based off of this person's it was like a third person perspective you know kind of writing about this character right first person lyrics but the overall perspective was sort of macro and then like this moon with moon here that we knew it want, we wanted it to be a sequel. Like, cause at the end of sun eater, you know, Johnny writes really sort of opaque lyrics, which I really like. Um, there's a lot that's open to interpretation and yes. you don't know if, um, you know, the character dies or if he's dead and he's in purgatory or if he's just in one long trip or what. And so we really wanted to kind of take it and just like really push the boundaries of, of what this character was going through. And they, they did continue to have like even crazier life stuff happen, but we really went more into like how deep down the rabbit hole could you go into this like hallucinogenic existential, um, you know, sort of esoteric uh, breadth of information that there is. And so, um, yeah, so we just, and I'd read a ton of this shit. Like I've, I've always been interested in this stuff. Um, you know, books like, um, Spirit Molecule from Rick Strassman yeah. um, and uh, Terrence McKenna's stuff, um, True Hallucinations, Food of the Gods. Um, this author I love named Daniel Pinchbeck, uh, who wrote a book called 2012, Return of Quetzalcoatl, uh, just all this crazy occult stuff, UFOs, crop circles, um, you know, Iboga and um, Yahe and all these different experiences uh, that you can have and that, you know, human beings have been using for 10,000 years. And so... Johnny and I would just trade shit all the time. And so he crafted these, this story of um, this person basically like kind of going and experiencing this and meeting all these like sort of lower level Gnostic demons and all this crazy shit. Um, And then we kind of took it and like continued to push it further to try to bring the the video side of things in. Cause um, uh, my buddy Kyle and I uh, did the videos for the first two videos and Johnny was co-director as well. So we were just like, coming up with like how do we visually represent this stuff and um so it's really cool so it's, it's, it's really like uh something you kind of have to digest i think over a long period of time it's not really it could be a cool listen maybe once through um but i think it's definitely something that like if you get into the lyrics and then figure out where all that stuff came from and like research some of the stuff on your own it's it's pretty fun 
and it's it's a deep deep ass rabbit hole that you can go down you know yeah that's awesome i am excited to read all of the lyrics because i'm a huge fan of johnny's lyrics i i think he's one of the best lyricists of the past like 15 20 years however long he's been doing it his lyrics just get better and better and better over time and often when i'm writing lyrics i'll go and read through people's stuff who i like and johnny is always one who i revisit so i'm really excited he- to to read through that we did like uh, i was trying to like i had to make a visualizer today while i've been working on it all weekend for the focus single and um i was trying to like figure out what to to make you know and so i was like well the ai stuff is interesting right and i think that what can be really cool about it is that to use it as sort of a a creative tool Mm -hmm. and maybe like I, i probably won't even end up using any of the shit that i made but it gave me other ideas and um so part of it is like, you know, taking the song lyrics and throw them into mid journey or stable diffusion or whatever and see what it visually comes oh, yeah, up. Yeah, oh yeah. That's a really cool idea. And it was interesting with Johnny though, because I love this too, is that like, if you notice like the lyrically before there would be, you know, uh, we suggested playing Barry and the Serpent's Lamb uh, for that Blue Ridge Fest. And Johnny's like, hell no. I was like, why? He's like, there's so many fucking lyrics. I can't get them all out. <laughs> yeah, Cause he used to write like that, like Bibles, you know? Totally. And, yeah. um, at, at right at the sun eater he kind of turned and went into like you know it's like that jizza uh lyric you know too many songs weak rhymes is mad long make it brief son half short twice strong you know it's like it's saying true. more with less there yes and so there's like six or seven sentences per song that's it and so that was interesting for me because i'd be like oh i had to kind of mess with the prompts and like interpret what he was saying to create something else because there was so little actual, you know, lyrics that you can't just go, okay, one line gives you 10 seconds of video, you know? Um, so I think that it's cool. I, I always love that side of, of lyrics. Like, you know, if something is good, it's worth repeating, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's something to that. I mean, even like uh, choruses, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like when you come back and say the same thing again and like you just hammer it in, you know, I think there's something to that. And I think there was always something maybe in tech death where it was like, not cool to do that. You know, like, especially in like symbolic world, like we rep repeats stuff. So little, yeah, every yeah. riff has to have a new tail, you know, yeah, yeah. everything's yeah. gotta be morphing and evolving the whole time. But I'm also like, dude, but a good riff is a good riff. You know, yeah. a good I lyric totally line is a good lyric line. I think Arch Spire is a really good example of that. They repeat stuff. And I think yeah. that's a lot of what, sticks you to like keeps their music stuck to your brain is the the stuff that repeats it's all it all just sticks in there but i also want to talk about blue ridge so you guys oh, yeah. played the the day of blue ridge that didn't get canceled right it was sick yeah, yeah it was great <laughs> blue and- ridge was tight it was a really, it was a really fun time <laughs> i had a blast dude that's awesome uh and it was your guys's <laughs> first show in like forever so how was it First of all, it's weird. Like first shows are always kind of, you know, weird to get used to going back just on a tour or whatever. So how was it playing uh, Blue Ridge in front of like 30,000 people or however <laughs> many people yeah. for your first show back in like 10, eight years? I don't know how long. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, it, a, a little bit nerve wracking, but really not. Yeah. Um, I think I, I ended up doing like a beer or maybe a shot with Johnny <laughs> beforehand. Um, and it was like as soon as we got together, you know, it was like in the first 30 minutes, like inside jokes that I hadn't even said or heard in seven years. We're all right there. It was so like riding a bike. It was great. And, um, yeah, so it was, it was really cool to get back out there. The only thing I would say about it is like, you know, we did a quick little like warm up show at this, uh, punk venue, um, oh, right. the night before, but it Where was, was so that? hot. What venue? What's that? What venue was it at? Oh, dude, I don't even know what it was called. Maybe I see Mike in the chat. Maybe he remembers what it was, um, but brutal, like cr- super karate in the pit, very karate in the pit <laughs> all night. Like I almost got kicked in the face three times. Oh, geez. Um, Somebody, Alicia came to the, like kind of from side stage to the side to kind of get some video. And somebody just, just ran full speed and slammed her into the drum kit. And I fucking just stopped playing and ran off stage and just fucking, went and picked her up because nobody was picking her up and oh, was, you yeah. know, had to stop playing and shit and almost got kicked in the face three or four times. So the energy was like really hype and crazy, but it was so hot. We couldn't even finish the set. I mean, I could have kept going, but Johnny was fucking done. He was like, I'm going to l- literally pass out. Um, but um, so we did that to kind of kick that first little bit of rust off and not have the, the very first time we play in front of people again, be 30,000 people. Um, 
but there was a, you know, it's like the first, like maybe 15 seconds. You're like, Oh shit. All right, here we are. It's happening. And then it was like, ah, cool. Just like locked right in. And then you're just like, man, I wish this was a tour, you know? Yeah. yeah just totally. one show. You yeah. One I mean? show that's uh, rough. That, yeah. That'll just get you. You're like, no, why can't we do more? This sucks. Right. Cause, cause you know, like, you don't play, you really lock in on that like fourth night or something. Oh, hell yeah. And you're like, yeah, it's fucking old. Dude, you know one I mean? week, one week into tour, that's when it's, that's when you're hot. That's when yeah. you're okay with people coming to the show. On the last uh, tour that we did, Revocation, uh, Tracy from Metal Blade came to the first night. And I was like, no, the first night <laughs> we were having like all kinds yeah. of technical difficulties and shit. I was <laughs> like, sucked. really? This is the first time you're seeing us. And it's just the first, you know, but it's the first night. That's a rule though. Anytime the label's there, it's it's going to. Anytime uh, the label's there. Just a ton of bad so, shit's going to happen. Yeah, New, always, always. New York was flooding the night that we were playing at St. Vitus, and the show was sold out, but all of New York was under a flood, so a ton of people couldn't make it to the show, and it was technical difficulties and just, you know, one just of those. brutal. Sucked. Yeah, one of those. Uh, yeah, but... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Nabi. No, I was just going to inquire if we had any questions for Nick. Yeah, I was wondering about yeah, that. Oh, yeah. Sorry, we kind of... Oh yeah, the it's chat. interesting when you do the like, it, you know, the hang. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I keep trying to pop down to the chat and like answer back and say hi to people. And, <laughs> I know I've almost yeah, kind of forgotten what? that we're even live right now because we're <laughs> just talking to Nick, our homie Nick. <laughs> I'll be right Sorry, back. No, so which exactly. is great. Which is great. I just no, wanted fantastic. to make sure if we uh, people got their question, oh, questions yeah. answered, if there was any. I I see Merc Zero Ain Matter, my very first band. Oh yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you about that. Two basses, drums, and vocals. Um, no regular guitars. We were actually anti-guitar. Okay. Um, and yeah. And it was like post Mudvayne, you know, like th wanting to do that. And I was like, but the only thing is like when you're up high on the bass, then the low end goes away. So we're like, well, what if we just had another bass player Yeah. and you just went back and forth. And then we started using AB pedals and doing like, um, you know, a side through a bass amp and the B side would be a Mesa dual rec. And then we had like a full bass stack and a full guitar stack on both sides of the stage. So then wow. when we were kicking, it was, it was super heavy and super fun. And, and, uh, I wish we could have kept that, kept that project going, but did you guys record anything with that? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Recorded with Dave Otero back in Oh four or Oh five. Oh wow. It's, it's awesome. No sound replacement on the drums and it's fucking, it sounds great. I'll have to send you it. It's very, it's got a little core in it, little core in there okay, and a little, little Dillinger, you know, right. but, uh, and a little simpler then, you know, I, th I think where we were going to go would have been really cool, but it's still fun. Hi, Alicia. That sounds really cool. Alicia's here. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, uh, did, we got Ian. Did Dave, uh, Dave Otero record? He records Cephalic, right? Yep. Mm hmm Okay. Did he do Lucid Interval? Yes. Wow. Yep. Crazy. He did Lucid, and um, I heard a story about that that, like, Devin Townsend was like way into that record for a little while. That's one of my favorite albums of all time. No shit. Yeah. Yeah. And I, new, I, every time I every time I revisit it, I'm like, yep, this fucking kills. Are we talking? We're, like we gotta, we're talking about Cephalic right yeah. now. Yeah. Just like the production and like how yeah, it's just like anti grid and just fucking sounds so sick. And the drums, yeah, like the snare drum that, on there is just fucking. Oh God, I think that's the like the record that really put Dave. That showed showed the world what Dave Otero was capable of doing. Yeah, you know. Fuck, that's. I was thinking about that the other day. I was like, did he do that album? Because yeah. it sounds yep. so good. I think the first thing he did actually was called Halls of Amenti. Have you ever listened to that? Yeah, yeah, like the Doom album that they did. Yeah, it's like yeah. 20, one song, twenty minutes long. Definitely. Yeah. We played it. We played it once in uh, like Halls. Uh, what's that? The Roadburn. Roadburn. The the Doom Fest in uh, the Netherlands, and they oh, asked yeah. us specifically to come play it. <laughs> And like Josh, the old bass player, filled in for Zach because he couldn't miss his his wife's birthday or something. And um, we were so high because Len <laughs> brought. You know, that was back in the when Silver Surfer was member of Silver Surfer Vapes. Oh, oh. Do you know I remember those. Hell yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Hell and yeah. like Len brought it on stage, and we were in wherever we were, and we were just like already super ripped and then like at the start of the set i watched the video because it was pro shot of this like really good pro shot and board <laughs> audio yeah. and like it was like four minutes we're like playing this ridiculous intro where all the sounds on a macbook like all the stock sounds we just had them play like in a row next to each other and it was the most in and it just went up for like two minutes 
of like, what the fuck? <laughs> we're smoking the whole time. <laughs> oh my God. And I had uh, recessed bass strap locks for my bass and I forgot my strap. And so I, I had to like make to- toothpick straps and try to oh, do them no. in. I forgot my fucking tuner. <laughs> I'm just baked as shit up there and just like blowing it so hard. <laughs> it's, the, all these Dutch people are just like, yeah. Oh, dude. It, it was sick, dude. <laughs> that's how I want to see Cephalic, though. You know, that's like, oh, yeah. that's the Cephalic brand to me. <laughs> if I don't see that, then it's like, am I really at the show? <laughs> that's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's cool. what that's was the question that you asked him? I didn't ask him. Oh, oh, okay. it, was, it was about his old band. Oh, uh, gotcha. A- oh, Matter. yeah. Oh. oh, any more Ain Matter? Um, I actually wrote, um, the drummer and I started jamming. It's like my, you know, my buddy from third grade. And uh, we taught each other how to play. You know, like I'd go over to his, I, I was playing guitar at the time, but and he was playing drums. And once we linked up and started, you know, we taught each other how to play. And we had that like thing where we can go and jam and just free jam. And it'll sound like a written piece of music because we have that, that you know, unspoken connection. And um, it wasn't really like cohesive of a split when, because we never, never really exactly kind of broke up. But like once I joined Cephalic, they were not down. Like they were so like, they, they saw it as like an act of betrayal, you know, that I was joining another band It was a, and I was like, I'm that? not quitting. And I was like, just chill because I'll talk to relapse and like get us a fucking deal, you know? And, um, and sure enough, like a year and a half after, uh, that Cephalic record came out and Gordon from, from relapse was like, Hey man, what's up with Aim matter? And I was like, they fucking hate me. <laughs> oh. So, um, but anyways, in like 2015, we started jamming again and I wrote, we wrote about seven or eight new songs that are really fucking cool. And then like, um, I started getting busy with Havoc again and he was kind of the same thing. He's like, Oh you. man, you did it again. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I just kind of like, they're just, those songs are just like rotting on a hard drive. Like we recorded it really well too. And, um, I actually got, uh, Ryan Martini to play. Um, oh, on, a couple of the, on a couple of the tracks and Ryan and I were saying stuff back and forth. Cause I was like, Oh, that'll be the ultimate, you know, full circle thing. Oh yeah. And the stuff's really cool. We got to, I got to finish it and put it out. Cause it is, it's fucking cool. It's like weird and heavy, but, um, very bass centric, obviously. But yeah, Otero was a hell of a drummer it, and, uh, uh, dethroned. He played in another band called moth for a little bit too. Very, very sick. Yeah. You're welcome, brother. Face so, in your face, dude. So are you just like writing music all the time? Kind of. Yeah. I mean, I think right now I'm mean, like, I mean, the video thing is really kind of taken over. Yeah. Um, so I'm always doing some kind of editing, filming or editing. Um, so you're working this, on other people's stuff as well. What are you? Sometimes. Yeah. Well, I kind of joined this other band. I did join them. This band King from LA. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Which is kind of, it's K Y N G mm-hmm. and it's kind of like, like uh it's like a kaius kind of a thing where it's like kind of stonery almost like the pantera level heavy riffs with like cornell-esque vocals on it um eddie's a fucking phenomenal singer and um so i um along with my buddy kyle kyle's like the main director videographer dude and then like you know we bring the ideas to him we film and then like we work on editing together and i'll usually do the effects or any of that kind of stuff so i did that and then um I did a video for Ryan Martini's other band, Soften the Glare, um, called Left Handed Lion. Um, and then, um, yeah, there's this other band that's like these three like world leaders that I, I do most of their videos. Um, and then uh, Pepe did leave from music school. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so that stuff's been taking a lot. And the, this record has been like, uh, there's been so much going on because Johnny's, you know, got his kids and yeah. his full time job and all this stuff. And so like, I've kind of had to like pick up a lot of the, um, the busy work side of stuff. So a lot of the, a lot of the press, um, and, uh, like dealings with the labels and all that kind of stuff. Hey, we need this by this date and all that kind of stuff. I've been kind of handling all that shit. So, um, things should hopefully calm down to the point where I can sit back on a computer and like, just have like, you know, I don't know, a couple of weeks off and like be able to do something, write something, yeah. you know? Yeah. I feel it. But that's good though. Right. We need those those long swaths of when you can't write so that yeah. when you do it like builds up like your creative juices build up yeah, and yeah. Then you're like oh this is rad instead of like uh, feeling forced yeah. or something it's like a hose I think so, it's like yeah. when you hold the hose shut absolutely yeah i like 
don't write on tour usually. Uh, so when I get home from tour, I'll have all of these things that I want to write about and get out. So, yeah, I think that is important. It's important do to you, not. Go ahead. And I agree. I agree. Do you keep, speaking of that, when you're on tour, do you keep a, uh, do you have like a note section on your phone where like yeah. people will be talking, you're like, that's a good song title, and then you write it down? Yeah, I have a note section on my phone. I also will like take a notebook with me because I like to just write things out. Um, and then when I go through and write lyrics for a release, I'll like, pick through things that I had written and see if that's a thread to start anything, you know, that will inspire like a, a song or it just depends. Sometimes I don't use any of it. I have notebooks upon notebooks of stuff that I'll never use, but have you ever gone back and read it and be like, this is sick. Why did I ever use this? Absolutely. And I've used, I've used stuff from 10 years ago. I mean, I have notebooks back to when I was in like eighth grade. So Whoa, yeah, it's a lot of so stuff. Cool. Luckily my parents kept that stuff and yeah, I have all of it. So it's cool to I go back. My through. mom did with my stuff. It's somewhere. I think there's some randomly my mom, she's listening right now. <laughs> randomly she'll find, send, send a picture of something. I think I was pretty funny back in school. I was like, I would always <laughs> fuck with everybody. And like, she would send me like, uh, mom, you'll have to send me some later. But there was one thing that she sent me. where I was just like, kind of just mess with the teachers and stuff too. Just, I've always just been a smart ass. You yeah. Know? yeah. Um, <laughs> me too. But it's, it, it's funny to go back and I'll, I'll find some of the stuff from like maybe 15 years ago, um, 16, 17 years ago when I first started like Ain matter and stuff. And I'll go back and find lyrics. And it's weird. Cause you're like, you're not the same person that wrote that. No, you know, not and at like all. to see it's it's almost like gives you a gauge of like how you've grown and how you've changed as a person to see what you thought was cool to write about or where you were at, you know? Absolutely. And how your vocabulary has expanded. I mean, I have yeah. like some of the lyrics from eighth grade are like very, I mean, they're eighth grade lyrics, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm just like, wow, this is really cringy now, but you know, it's cool like, to see where you started. It's You're like magnets. <laughs> How do they work? <laughs> That's what's That's good about like not writing lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> when I see myself yeah. playing drums in eight, eighth grade, I'm like, I'm hey, pretty sick. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I have songs. It's funny because people, you know, a lot of the, the press and stuff has been about, um, obviously the doom question comes up uh, all the time with this band, which will never not happen. What's, but, the, qu um, what's the doom question? Well, just like the doom, you know, the evolution of the band from doom, you know, like the whole death, is this death core or is this not? Naveen and I are going to, uh, uh, if you're still down to do that AMA tomorrow. I'm Reddit. down, man. Cool. Um, so it's going to be in the death core thing. Oh, okay. And we, I was like, okay. You know, and they're like, we know you're not death core, but it's, it's the biggest AMA or it's the biggest Reddit subgroup or whatever. It's going to be one of the best ones. Mm -hmm. And so, um, when when it first came out, I mean, I have a song that I recorded with Cephalic back in two thousand and late two thousand six, two thousand seven. That was on the Xeno Sapien record. It's called Molting. That song was originally uh, about Job for a Cowboy. In a pretty much a negative song, kind kind of a parody, <laughs> you know, um, because it was like, you know, this band comes out. They're sixteen years old, or fifty, you know, what however old they were, and MySpace comes out. Right. Yeah. And it's at a, at that time where it was like the first time when you could say like, oh, hey, you know, add me on this online friend group and we can be online friends. Like that was fucking not cool until like 2004. You said that in 2001. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, but so I think that was kind of part of what made MySpace cool is that you could put music up on there and that there was like, oh, go check out this band, check out my band on MySpace. And then that's why you made a profile. So it was like a way to suck people into like, that it's cool to be in an online social group um, was because it, you know, it was based around the bands. And so, um, but from the external perspective from old school death metal bands who I, you know, I joined into because I was 23 at the time. I wasn't that old. Um, and it was kind of like, I don't want to say it, it's just like, did you, it felt undeserved that like these kids that like, damn, you know, like we've been grinding for six albums now and this band has four songs on this website that go viral. And now they're, you know, at the top of these lineups. Um, and just the whole thing with it too, like the scene the scenes through McNally, just the, these haircuts, yeah. you know, yeah. yep. and the, and the, and the, and the wearing your sister's jeans. Um, that whole thing was just kind of like, 
it was just almost kind of comical to us um, at the time. And so <laughs> there was like, like this, it was, it was, you know, uh, in good fun, but I remember the, but the lyrics were kind of all based on that. Like we literally like, you know, I will run the scene da, 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 da. <laughs> in my sister's jeans. <laughs> and like our new song is huge on my space. And it was this whole fucking thing. And Zach hated the lyrics so much that he made Len go retrack them. Cause he's like, we're not doing that. You know, I guess the, they didn't get cleared through Zach first. It actually caused a pretty big rift between them. And Dave Otero was pissed cause we spent a whole day tracking those lyrics. Then he just had to press delete. But the beginning of it, the beginning of the track, it would have gotten cut, but it was, you know, Len being like taking our anger out on job for a cowboy take two. <laughs> and the song started. <laughs> and then, you know, four years later, I'm like in that band. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> why, how did you join the band? Um, so Cephalic and Despised Icon did a run together in Europe. Um, and uh, it was like fests and, you know, we were doing the off, uh, off shows together. And um, I became buddies with Al. Um, and I gave Al, I brought, you know, I'm always joking around and I have these, these stupid wigs with me a lot of the times back then. And so I had this really dorky, stupid wig and I gave it to Al before a set and I was like, Hey, you should wear this, you know? And so he put it on and then, uh, the other singer, not Alex, but, ah, oh, fuck. It was a long uh, time ago. Steve, is that his name? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So Steve put it on and they were like, and Alex got super bummed and, um, <laughs> cause they don't like, pres- you know, <laughs> just so like Al and, and, uh, uh, Alex got into a real big fight afterwards. Physical, real physical, <laughs> like fucking Jesus. loud packing oh, Because sounds, he put punches. the wig on Steve? I, uh, because Al was wearing it and Steve was wearing it. But I guess that that was just the catalyst. I guess it was like three years of buildup. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? That was just like the straw that broke the camel's back. Damn, but so anyways, Al and I were really good buddies. It was all that MySpace anger <laughs> that sick. blowing up on MySpace <laughs> <laughs> anger. <laughs> it's funny then because they ended up writing a song called Man Made of Glass when Al left to join job for a cowboy. Um, and uh, that song's all about, you know, it's kind of a diss song towards Al and they're cool now, but if you go back and read the lyrics to that, it's all have fun playing cowboys in the desert or some shit on ah. a, a despise icon record. Damn. <laughs> but, um, but so anyways, then I, I was uh, doing a, some session work down in Arizona and uh, Charn was drumming. And so Charn and I became friends. Um, and uh, it wasn't like three weeks later that he hit me up and he's like, dude, Brent just left us in the middle of a tour. Um, can you come record with us? It wasn't even oh, wow. like the tour was later. There was a recording with Sukov. And so my very first thing with job was just like show up and record an EP, uh, which was Whoa. fun and crazy. You know? Yeah. yeah. That's pretty wild. I don't know. Like it, it's one thing to jump in for shows and get kind of a feel for everyone and feel comfortable riding with each other. And then, but just to jump into writing, that's, that's a lot. Yeah, that's crazy. It was, it, was, it, it was intense and it was really technical. I mean, I think it was considerably more technical than than uh, the cephalic stuff. Mm. You know, that that gloomy P was just, the, the, you know, matching what Tony was doing. And Tony's this insane guitar player. And I was like, well, I hadn't quite gotten into the realm of being able to like bounce out from what the guitarists are saying and sort of be like a, 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 a an extra melody line that kind of happens now you know like tony will play i guess it's kind of like when you're talking about the style of it now it's like there'll be like these kind of arpeggiated chords you know and that like extra little space like leaves room to put little fills and and you know have the bass kind of pop out and say other stuff instead of just like hitting a root note um and so i wasn't quite there and um so it was like, oh, well, it really only made sense to match them a lot. And it was fucking really hard. And that, I remember being intimidated, like, oh, shit, am I going to fucking play this stuff? Um, and then meeting Jason for the first time, just like, you know, out of the blue. You know, like, oh, yeah. Don't know anything about him. And yeah, he's, yeah. <laughs> he's a fucking character. You're like, what's up with this guy? So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so it was it was a fun experience, you know. And I think that there's, there's kind of like um, something that I think like a lot of the, the, the YouTube, Twitch, uh, TikTok generation of musicians now that get all the endorsements because um, co- companies are like, oh yeah, oh you just play live, like yeah. It's like this guy just played to off. more people that than you true. will ever play to in your entire life off one video. People ask, yeah. me, people ask Naveen <laughs> all the time how how to get endorsed, and it's like that is the reality. The way to do it nowadays is to have followers on the internet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, I remember Charn telling me 
um, one time, like, I think this was back in the uncle acid times. And it was like, everybody tightened up. There was like a, a, a real tightening up. And I don't know, I, the 2015, 16 ish or something. Um, all the companies pulled back from how much they were down to like bro out as far as hundred percent endorsements. Um, but that was when it was first kind of coming up and they're like, Hey, so, you know, we noticed your, you, you know, where's the social posts, you know, and that was kind of the start of it. Now it's like, if you don't have that, you know, they're kind of like, uh, yeah, well, it's a good time to start your, start to get it, get an Instagram profile, get a YouTube build in and then, you know, build that up and come back and we can talk again later, you know? Yeah. I mean, it makes sense though. Right. Cause think about it. All right. You yeah, go out course. in Naveen and you play to 3000 people say, right. Um, how many of those 3000 people at said fest or whatever are drummers? Right. Right. A. And then how many of them can see what sticks you're playing or going to be likely to be influenced to buy that stick as a result of seeing you play live versus you have 3000 people watching you on your YouTube channel, the percentage of those people that are drummers yeah. and that can see your little logo thing and be like, so from a business perspective, I get it. Yeah. Um, but it also is just a little like, oh man, it's like, it's just life is just <laughs> different as yeah. you know, touring doesn't mean what it means. I think to us anymore, to the, to the endorsers the yeah. way that it no. used to. Um, and it's just something I guess we just you know, have to fucking adapt, you know? Yeah, yeah I mean, there over time, I've seen people like at the beginning of it when Alex Rudinger and, you know, he was really like the first person to me to do like drum playthroughs. He was the first person that I saw. And he's the JFAC of drummers. He's the JFAC of drummers. <laughs> uh, you know, he was the first. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember when Alex was putting out videos and then some people followed suit, but there were a lot of people who were super hesitant and just have thought that it was cheesy still to this day, even, you know, with their vocalists now putting yourself on the internet, it helps a ton, but I yeah. still see people, people still think it's cheesy. And over time, it's like, those are the people who end up kind of falling behind. And I want to yeah. tell people, I want to like shake them and be like, dude, I know that this used to be cheesy and it's, it's not cool from your perspective or whatever, but this is genuinely going to help your career. If you just learn a little bit about video, you don't, you really only have to film yourself on your phone. You just have to figure out how to like hook yourself, plug yourself into an iRig and then you can get yourself on the internet, but it helps so much. And like with our band, I can't, I can't properly convey how much TikTok has changed the trajectory of our band. Like, yeah, there's I mean, so many it's nuts Dude. watching, watching it, you know, from an external perspective and being super proud and stoked. And, and, you know, not like in some cases where you'd see somebody that was undeserving or be like, these fucking TikTok kids fucking get <laughs> You're like, oh shit. Somebody, you know, my friends are fucking, it, it's awesome to see, you know? Well, thank um, you. and I remember even at first when he first started putting, you know, reels and stories up of like just acapella death metal vocals, you know, with like the music kind of down and, um, at first, you know, you're kind of like, oh, shit, Scott Carstairs just fucking raided us. What's up, bro? <laughs> um, Scott Truck Ramp. Um, but, uh, oh, Truck like, Ramp. Um, there he is. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, seeing that at first, and it was like, I was like, I kind of knew. I was like, oh, this is going to be shocking for people, yeah. you know? And then that, I feel like TikTok really opened up, maybe because the algorithm uh, was more open on that one at the time, because, you know, China wanting all your data or whatever. Yeah, totally. I mean, the, the algorithm now on TikTok is nothing like it was. I feel lucky that that I caught on to it when I did because now it's like if you get 20,000 views on a video, you're like kind of TikTok viral. But when we first started posting, like those videos were shooting up to a million plays in a day. It was insane. Wow. It was insane. I remember the first TikTok video that I posted that went viral. I was like caregiving and I was at work and I had posted a video at two o'clock and I was talking because my uh, uh, I was caregiving for one of my best friends and he was way into metal. And I was like, Jesse, check out this video, dude. It's going it's got six hundred thousand views. And I looked back at it like an hour later. Oh, my God, it's got seven hundred and fifty thousand views. Gosh. And it's like every video would blow up like that back then. And it's just TikTok is not the same now. But what I do feel like is really popping off is Instagram reels. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, I had some weird, um, stuff recently, you know, cause I was like, I shut my Instagram down for a while. Cause I was like, 
I'm sick of this shit. I'm sick of like having to create something every single day and only be relevant to what you made today. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was just like, I don't know. It felt like, you know, growing up, you know, I watched the Pantera home videos like with my cousins and we would just like mosh in our living, throw all the fucking couch pillows into the fucking center of the living room and just fucking mosh and go ape shit. And like watch those videos of these guys, um, basically raging around the world and having a blast, you know? And I was like, whoa, you can do that. You know, watching a year and a half in a life of Metallica or the Guns N' Roses videos and be like, that's, that's when it was like, I want to do that, you know? And um, it's interesting to see that when people nowadays, um, it's like, that's such, it's like that, it, that's almost disconnected from it. It's more about now, like, you know, I'm going to be a TikTok star. Or I'm going to be an, a YouTube star, even the kids. You know, yeah. would be like, that's what they're, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up an influencer? You yeah. know, they don't hear rock star. You know what I mean? And so, um, that a little bit of that, I think there was some hesitation with it, um, yeah. with me. So I, I was kind of like, this kind of bums me out that this is, this is modern musician is your work every day. You know, it was like go on tour then you come home, you know, maybe do an interview here or there, but then you get to chill. And then it's like, nope, you will yeah. work every single day. Yeah. You will post yeah. every single day. So that kind of bummed me out. But then I was like, I mean, it's not that much work and to really just have fun with it. And so anyways, I started to back up and then like I changed my profile to comedian instead of <laughs> musician. And I don't know what the fuck, but all of a sudden I'll post like memes and get like millions of views. Dude, that's amazing. Around, like, really? It's super weird. Yeah. But then I post a music one and it's like, <laughs> 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 that's so sick though. So you're doing that on TikTok. What's your, uh, where? Oh, no TikTok yet. No oh. TikTok yet. I have yet to, cross the tiktokian threshold um in my in my, in my i mind. don't really go on there so where yeah naveen doesn't go on there yeah. i just post videos for him i made him make a profile but he i don't even post under is it, hotter, is it hotter shot now you know it was hot it was it was old school fire it's, what is a, it now? it's a little <laughs> it still can be hot but it is more shot than it used to be it still can be hot though but you know people are under the impression that first of all you're like a really funny guy and you already make funny i mean you're saying that you're doing memes or whatever i feel like that would do really well on tiktok tiktok yeah. is kind of like made for that type of stuff um sure true, true. but it's what's not, the new thing though the new thing there's not a, that's like what YouTube, you know because tiktok came out we never thought there'd be a new one you know youtube like, oh, stories youtube uh has reels now that is a good place to post. Those are getting... Because that, that's Google, right? So when Google wants to take over this whole social game, like they will, right? <laughs> Potentially. So Why it makes sense they? like get in on the ground floor. I mean, I thought about that because I was twitching for a while. Um, and uh, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was fun. It was really cool. But I was like, man, it's just a, a ton of work. Yeah, yeah. And oh it's just God. like the juice I didn't feel like was worth the squeeze at the time. That's how and I people too. are like, you can't do it for the juice at first. You know, like it's going to be a slow build thing. I was talking to Mike Leon about that stuff. Um, but uh, Kick, have you guys heard of Kick? I have heard of Kick in passing. Yeah. What can you explain it? It's, what is what's going on? It's with like it? it's like Twitch, but uh, the split is like way sicker. OK, yeah. Someone was telling me about this. Who is the big uh, is there a big metal person on Kick right now? I think so. Yes. Um, trying to remember who, but there's a, there's a, a, a bunch of fools that started going, um, that way, you mm-hmm. know, because Twitch is slowly kind of tapering down the percentages and that kind of stuff. I'm sure they're about to fucking kick everybody out of this chat for talking about that. <laughs> they're like, yeah. all right, they're done <laughs> on to kick. We go not next kick. <laughs> Do not, do not kick. But you know, we've That's always been the, the Twitch thing has been the same for us. You know, all of Scott's people are in here right now and, with Scott, I'm always like, dude, how do you do that? You're just learning songs all the time to play in your in your Twitch stream. That seems insane, like a totally full time job to me. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, okay. So I just saw uh, uh, Kick pays ninety percent of oh, wow. subs, where where uh, um, Twitch pays twenty five. That's insane, right? Yeah, I mean, and that's if you're gonna do it. But I was like, there maybe there's just different people like. Uh, like Pete from Havoc, right? He was, I think he still twitches and he was doing it for a while. And it was one of those deals where um, he's got one of those minds, I think. And I don't know if this is just because it's drums or something or his memory, where he's got like a thousand songs in his playlist that he could do. And I'm like, I could not do that on bass. Yeah, I couldn't do that. Like th- yeah. that would take me like 
a year to learn a thousand songs or more. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I'm like, I too busy with, you know, saying yes to being in five fucking bands or six bands. Yeah. Like I, I don't have the time to do that. You know, I just don't have the I drive I, to do it. I'm it's not, I'm not like passionate about learning a thousand covers. You know? Yeah. I don't think I am either. <clears throat> and no I diss to it. It's just like, if you're, if that's like your thing, then Twitch is for you. you know, but for me, true. I'm not really. I think it has to yeah. be something you're passionate out. about. It has to be something that you're like willing to put love into. That's true. Yeah. Authenticity. Right. Yeah. And yeah. honesty. Right. As an yeah. artist. Cause that's, you know, like we were talking about if, if you go on there and people are like, Oh, this dude's just getting on Twitch to try to make money. Like you can just feel it, yeah, you yeah. know? Oh, totally. Yeah. And I think it's weird. Alicia says she likes the fire in the back. <laughs> I, <laughs> I really I said, like that too. You have a very nice setup. I'm, yeah. I'm impressed by no, this. I tossed this sick. together in like, in like five minutes before the interview. Dude, you shows. never know when you get on a live <laughs> chat with someone, if they're just going to be like in a not well writ, lit room or something cool, yeah. like what you if have they're going to be on. iPhone. <laughs> I like, have this exact same camera angle and everything and all the JFAC press that I just did, but it's in the daytime. And so all of this stuff around here, it looks so WT, you know, uh, that's, that's white trash. For, okay. I was like, what's WT? <laughs> yeah. White trash. <laughs> I was like, I better clean up a little bit. Well, I mean, it was clean. It was just like, I just, I, 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 col I collect stuff too uh, much, not hoarder level, mm, yeah. but I got to get rid of hoarding some shit. tendencies. I, I, I need Marie, Marie Kondo. Oh yeah, um, dude. I uh, Marie Kondo. Do you have a storage unit? Um, this closet right to the left of me, pretty <laughs> oh, much. Yeah. We had a storage unit forever. Alicia and I, I think we paid. Oh, it hurts so bad. Yeah, it I was know. like seven or eight grand in over total. Like five years that we paid yeah, for yeah. shit that you're like, I don't even want I don't know what's shit. in there. Yeah, 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 I know. That's the thing. We never go to our storage unit. It got hit, hit half of it got hit by a tornado in December. So we haven't gone oh, since man. then. And uh, none of that stuff matters to me. Like I could, I know. it could have, the tornado could have swept it all away and I would have been fine with it. I just don't hold on to m material things like that. Like I'm not. Except for your notebooks from eighth grade. Except for my notebooks yeah. from eighth grade, which are there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's good. Oh shit. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad it didn't blow away. That's the only thing I would have cared about in there. But it's like that, uh, that Seinfeld had this one stand up bit where he was, he, he was just like, you know what? They're kind of the stuff in in, in uh, storage is kind of like it's in jail or it's like in prison, you know. And like you go in and you visit, you open the door. Hey guys, just checking, seeing how you're doing. I'm doing my best to get you out of here. You know, I'll be back and I'll, just, I'll come back. I'll try to come back in the next six months. And it's like perpetually that. And then we yeah. finally realized we're like, oh, we, we were able to move into this place where it has a closet, like a couple closets that are big enough, and we were able to get rid of some stuff. And like every like pretty much time we need to go in there for the stuff in the front that you have access to. We, we say like, we got to clean that out. Yeah, we're going yeah. to spend find a weekend here. We're going to get it done. We're going to, we're going to yeah. put the stuff that can sell on eBay and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, yeah, yeah, probably not. You know, I'm yeah, right I can't there. take any of it with you. Yeah, I'm we right there right now. None of it. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so are there any other questions for Nick in the chat? Uh, I think we all have a question for him. How do you pronounce yeah. your last name? Yeah. How do you pronounce? Ah, I know, so, how, I know how to pronounce it. Is it Shingelos? That's pretty much it. Yeah. Okay. It's like um, if you were to say the the D and the Z, if you say like a J. So Shingelos, like you're jealous of your shin. That's very easy. Much easier than it looks. I know. I know. I, I You know, <laughs> we've been looking back into the etymology of it and trying to figure it out. And like, you know, my brother did the 23 and me thing and like. I know. Then he, they update it and all of a sudden everything's different, you know? And it's just like, uh, I kind of, I'm just like, I wonder if it was like, je, if you're supposed like Shinjel, like the D and the Z and kind of like a, cause it's supposed to be Greek. And then it was like, um, yeah, I just, uh, I don't know. And that's why I kind of just like on socials and stuff, I was just like, people are always going to be getting it wrong. So I just put Nick Shins. Actually that came from a faceless tour. Uh, it was like metal Alliance or something. Do you remember Jeff Ficko? Yeah. Oh, hell yeah, dude. Yeah, liquid, liquid Jeff. Um, <laughs> Such a he sick vocalist, up. dude. Yes, dude. So I really, he almost, we talked about for when Johnny first was like, I'm raising my kids or kid at the time. And we were like, fuck, everybody wants to see this stuff live. And Johnny's like, you guys can get another singer and go to her. And we, I asked Jeff if he would do it. And Damn. he was down. Dude, so Jeff, he almost did. Jeff live was a sight to see. He was so yeah. sick live. Oh my God. He was great, dude. But yeah, no. um, he would come on the bus and couldn't be like Nikki Shins, and so then like just kind of stuck, and I ended up using that. Uh, somebody said I wanted to get this one. 
what was the whole thing you put in the thank yous in the vinyl booklet? Yeah, right, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna read it. Cool. Yeah, go did for you it. see it? Did you <clears throat> catch it? No, we, we haven't opened you the did? vinyl yet. Sealed, baby. Yeah, it's sealed. I know. I wasn't gonna do it, and then I was like all drunk. <laughs> yeah, no, which I don't drink that much at home. <laughs> That's how it and, goes. Uh, I think. I think. Oh, uh, <laughs> like Justin Chancellor came over. And like, I became friends with him was from Scott reader. Right. And so he comes over and like, I, 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 we, I went drinking with him all day and drinking martinis. I don't really drink martinis. I don't really drink that much at home anyways. And I was like eight or 10 martinis in. And I had said like, Oh, I got to do like the proper, like undoing thing. And I was drunk as shit. And I was like, Alicia, come fill me. And I was just like <laughs> oh, yeah. Fucking crinkling it and fucking it up and stuff. But uh, oh, where's the, okay. So. We did their, our thank yous and I had this really awesome, like heartfelt, authentic thank you list written. Um, but I, I ended up changing it to this. Uh, yeah, she, this is fucking crinkled, drunk Nick, asshole. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you, India. Thank you, terror. Thank you, disillusionment. Thank you, frailty. Thank you, consequence. Thank you, thank you, silence. Thank you, India. Thank you, providence. Thank you, disillusionment. Thank you, nothingness. Thank you, clarity. Thank you, thank you, silence. So when we were coming up with our thank yous for the record, I wrote this all big thing out. And then I don't know if the song came on or what the hell, um, or I was like typing, thank you, you know, and this, the, the, the lyrics just popped in my head of that, uh, that Alanis Morissette song. Oh my God. Yeah. Thank you, <laughs> India. Thank you. <laughs> Holy shit. So that's my thank yous for the record. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. is amazing that's i didn't tell anybody else so the only one that knew was johnny i didn't tell anybody else or i didn't tell anybody else and then uh we were at blue ridge and we were like at uh brett from revocations house who put up with us and fucking tm for us and did the put most up with you work. you're putting up with him man <laughs> <laughs> i'm just I mean, kidding i love both, brett with all of my yeah, heart he's one of the sickest dudes one of the, the best planet. fucking guys yes. ever yeah he's he's insane dude um I mean, the work that he did with us, we could have not have pulled that fest off without his help. Like, it was insane. Like, he'd lined up the gear, the practice space, like, the van, the trailer, getting us there, TMing on stage, like, making sure everything was sick, you know? Yeah, yeah. But anyways, we were out back in his little shed, you know, area drinking, which we did every night till, like, 6 a.m. Really smart <laughs> thing to do when you're getting ready for a show yep. um, in front of 30,000 people after seven years. But, um, <laughs> like, Al, Al had a copy of the lyrics. He was like, what the fuck is this thank you list? And he started reading it. And then about halfway through, he figured out what it was. And yeah. he just started rolling. <laughs> that's, like, that's great, dude. That's I'm glad somebody game. caught that because I, I didn't know if that how long that would go un, uh, unacknowledged. <laughs> it's a good thing the dude from... Uh despised icon wasn't in the band he probably would have beat you up over that <laughs> i probably would have got my ass beat. Yeah, yeah. but i would have had my back he's a, he's a he's a he's a scrappy little dude you know yeah. uh all right That's there's tight. there's some more questions in here damn there are a lot do you want to ask him or do you all you okay uh what drummer in your past brought out the most in your playing oh it's got to be naveen dude oh damn <laughs> you know what honestly i will say as far as like what i'm able to play like me with my name on it um what i'm able to play what i've been able to play like uh moon healer is the most expressive i've ever been able to be on bass mm. and sun eater i love love it's one of my favorite things and moon healers you know i, I it hasn't enough time hasn't passed for me to know if that's you know if it's there yet it's so weird that you know your connection to it but um but i love that uh the the stuff that i did on on sun eater but it was it was like in a in a lane you know there was very little slap on there at all like maybe two <clears throat> slap parts yeah it just didn't fit it just uh, you know i would try to throw it in we were down there with jason it would just be like nah it just feels forced yeah and something about the way you played on this stuff naveen was it just fit, it made sense I was like, oh shit. Cause I like, it would be so crazy. I couldn't match. And that was the thing. It's like, I would try to tell Danny when I was down there, I'd be like, chill out a little bit on this. And like stagger that fill. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I'll have time to be able to get it, you know? And some of your stuff was so crazy. There was no, no time. There, there's no way to match it and make it legit without pulling back to quarters or eighths or something. So I was like, I'll just fucking, you know, and, and I was able to just do slap stuff on this record of not being able to do on any other other record so um awesome. i would say for that reason it, it would be Naveen. Wow. you know every drummer i've played with is great but i mean that there's some of the most insane drums yeah i was surprised i was honestly kind of surprised like i would 
do stuff kind of joking around like oh like it's, i'll just do something totally insane and jason be like that's sick let's keep it i'm like all right fuck i'm down <laughs> like i love you guys were shit. totally just ha- into me like doing my full thing so uh, i told really um, fun. i told you uh what was that 2020 i told you I, I i was working on the song martha that became uh the sun gave me ashes so i sought out the moon um and there was this little part there. There's this little part in there that you were doing this super fucking weird time to me. It just ruined my brain. I spent like three hours figuring out like 10 seconds okay. of Holy what shit. you played. It was just like mind blowing, you know? And that was where I was like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to match up with everything that he's doing, mm-hmm. you know? And then it was like, there were parts where we did that. And then Jason was like, you can't do that. The whole record. That yeah. Will, that will be fucking annoying. Yeah. yeah. I was like, okay. <laughs> so we'll just went off and did my other stuff. I think know? it's got the right amount of matched versus not. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear, I hear I mean, what I you're sp- saying. The drums are a little like they're more aggressive than sun eater. So the slap bass fits better. Yeah. Yeah. It just, there was room for it to like, to go that direction. Um, I'll say, let's this other question. Did Cephalic write songs based on ex-girlfriend's phone numbers back in the day? Yes. Uh, I don't know if it was ex-girlfriend's phone numbers, but there's definitely um, social security numbers, phone numbers, <laughs> oh, addresses, yeah. driver's licenses, numbers. Be like, hey, we need a bridge. Be like, okay, how about, you know, I'm not, I almost just said mine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> like, but like, you know, I, I'm not, uh, it would it'd be easy because then it would be easy too for you like that really kook, kooky part in pseudo right um that's somebody's phone number okay and that made it really easy to remember they're like just it's steve's phone number you know so then you're like oh okay and it made it like uh, instantly recognizable when you're trying to remember what that crazy ass part was um and it's just a fun way to do it because like interpret it however you want is it a three count is it the third fret you know, like you can yeah, kind of yeah. use it as a, a cool, cool, quirky, weird writing thing, you know? I think Ron Jarzombek does that. That, that would make sense. I like phone numbers and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Dude has a crazy writing style. Yeah. Ron's stuff I, is like what he was explaining to you was just like so far beyond anything I could comprehend that. Driven. Yeah. His apps are sick. I don't know if you've ever seen those. Uh No. He has a couple apps like for writing and stuff. They're really cool. Um, what is it's Ron? Ron Jarzombek, yeah, like the guitar player. Wow, have I've you ever not, listened to his stuff? stuff no, man. Dude, oh, like, really? He's like my favorite guitar player. Removed. I have to have people like you guys, my and friends, like suggest things. Like I, I just feel like I don't have time. Yeah. That's it's a bullshit excuse. You know what I mean? I just like I'm like oh, I'm gonna you know, I That's like not- listening to old stuff brings me back to better times yeah, yeah it's not really a bullshit excuse it's just some people are way into this might not have heard discoverings it. Yeah. yeah i mean there's so much music that exists right now it's how could you ever have time to listen to all of it i read a stat that it was like something like a million new tracks to spotify per week oh my god so yeah. you know when i hear things like that i feel so grateful that anyone has heard any of the music that any of us have put out it's crazy. It's a really good point. Yeah, it's yeah, insane. It's, it's a large ocean to wade through to try to come up and be, you know, at the top where people can do it, you know? And you guys are crushing it, man. I mean, like, I see Entheos just continuing to go up and up and up forever, man. Thank you, Especially man. once you start bringing Thank in you. the the Nin Drake stuff, dude. Yep. So, <laughs> dude, Nin Drake. Let's go for it. Thanks, Nick. It's Nin, the same for you. Nin Drake. <laughs> Nin Drake. It's the same for you. Thank I, you. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, how was that? Was that a trip? Oh, getting shouted out by Drake. That was a, I saw him shout me out. So he messaged me like a week before he shouted me out and he was, no shit. yeah, he just told me he thought I was sick. And I was like, (laughs) cool. You know, if that's all that ever, he had followed me for like a month or so before that he'd followed the band. And I was like, cool. If that's all that ever comes out of it. Great. And then like, I saw him post me. Naveen was out of town and I saw the story and I just turned off my phone and went to sleep. I was like, I'm just going to let this simmer, simmer until tomorrow just, just, morning and just check it. And oh. yeah, I mean, then I was on like world star hip hop and all kinds of crazy, you know, Hollywood news sites. That was just, it's still really surreal. Even talking about it. I'm like, there's no way that ap- that actually happened to me. Because I'm, <laughs> I'm a huge well, Drake fan. Like I, oh, wow. I've listened That's- to Drake. I mean, 
dude, I've obsessed over Drake albums. Nothing was the same as like one of my des- desert island records. Like it's no shit. Yeah, wow. it's crazy to me that that happened. So and then the um, you know, my brother was in the one that sent to me that um, your mom's house. That. That was equally as surreal. I'm a huge yeah. Your Mom's House fan. I'd been listening to Your Mom's House since like the beginning of the podcast. So that was insane was there, to me. Was there like a little bit of inspiration to for you and Naveen to start a podcast? Did you pull any from that? Just like kind of the couple thing or? 100 million percent. And that was my inspiration for getting on TikTok as well. Like when really? I. Really? Yeah. When I listened to Your Mom's House, I was like, okay, they have this couple thing together. It's bringing a new, it's a new element to to podcasting where they can talk about a lot of stuff that other people can't talk about. Naveen and I have that in common. Maybe a podcast would work. That was totally an inspiration for us starting a podcast. And then, you know, Christina goes through and looks at like silly TikToks. So I was right. like, all right, I should get our band on TikTok. Just throw up some screaming videos on there. No way. And you manifested it. Did, yeah, I yeah. I mean, it's hard to not think that I manifested that. Right. It's Dude, kind of insane. That's sick. Yeah. So what's, what's next? What are you manifesting next? Erica Badu. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's tight. What about you? I don't you? know. Cause you I mean, keep. <laughs> me? What yeah, am what I are manifesting? You, what are you manifesting? Uh, just like a chill Sunday with nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> that is so, so true. the best answer. A pizza. Ever, so true. A pizza. <laughs> A, a nice cheese pizza. We did that yesterday, man. That was a good day. Those uh, are my favorite old fashioned. days. Are you guys still vegan? Are you vegan? No. no. I'm, I'm pretty much like mm, mm, vegan slash ve- ve- vegetarian. I'm primarily <laughs> vegetarian, but I do uh, F with a little bit of, if we're like out somewhere, I might F with a little bit of meat, but not at home. Sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Alicia and I broke, yeah. broke vegan edge pretty hard. Yeah. After <laughs> 10 years. Uh, you know damn 10 God, years of vegan remember, yeah we did it like t- solid we we went and we went to nam the very first nam we went to mm-hmm. i'm sure we actually i have a picture of us we're like at breakfast at, or something uh it, well that there's one of that but like the very first nam i think there was like all of us it was like wes Hauk. yeah, yeah dude yeah. i just and looked then, at that picture the other day because yeah. it came up in my memories i was like this yep. is a fucking epic picture and like yeah. wes and i weren't even in bands then yeah you know yeah it's crazy. Yeah, at that little pizza place yeah. in the corner. Yep. Yes. And so we raged really hard as you, as you kind of tend to do. And it was like brutal. Um, and so when we came back, Alicia and I were like, we need to do a cleanse. Like that was brutal. <laughs> and so we did the master cleanse. And um, during that time, like, you know, we were like no drinking, no smoking, you know, and you're not eating any, you're just drinking this lemon maple syrup, cayenne pepper, hell drink. Mm. That's all you can have. Um, and then, um, it was like 10 days. I only made it six. Alicia went the full 10, but we ended up, um, watching a bunch of documentaries cause we were like, well, we're not going out, you know, cause we're not going to go drink. So we stayed home and just watched a bunch of documentaries, forks over knives and yeah, all that yeah. kind of stuff. And we were like, oh, we well, have to ease back into meat after not eating for 10 days. Anyways, they're like, don't go get a steak, you know, like have some veggie broth to start and work your back. And we were like, let's, let's just do it. And we tried it. And like a week became a month became, you know, we, we, we were in it. And then it's like. God, I remember um, just struggling on tour with with yeah. uh, Al because Al and I did it, and it was just so hard back then, 2012, 2013. Oh yeah. Um, and I was I remember on that tour in Russia. Uh, I hate tomatoes. I've always hated them growing up. My mom would, would like have a tomato, I'd smell it, and I would throw up. I just always hated them. Wow. And so, anyways, we were in those on that Russian run, 16, 17 hour drive. Sometimes this one was a super long day, and the gas stations don't have food or concessions or like water it's like they have gas that's yeah, it so yeah. we'd tell our driver who looked like the dude from james bond so we would just call him 007 and we're like dude we're starving it's been 12 hours can we please get some food and they're like food at the food at at the you know hostel or wherever we're yeah. staying and um so we get there like 3 a.m this weird ass place in saratov russia middle of nowhere and um we go down in the basement and they bring food out and it's like this raw bacon called sala oh man and um and we were like hey for you know that we had told them in advance hey, we have two vegans you know yeah. and they were like uh oh yes and they bring out two plates 
one for Al, one for me, just like six slices of tomato. And like, oh, that was all the no. food that I no. got after like an entire day of starving. And I was like, oh God, I'm, I'm going to have to do it. So I just did like a half a salt shaker on it. And uh, I ended up, now I like tomatoes because I just had to break through that, oh, wow. through yeah. that barrier. But I remember being so like stressed out from it. Yeah. You know, that I was like, I think that this stress is like less healthy for me than the, vegan, yeah, than the know, diet. Yeah. yeah. That's not a fun, that's like not healthy. And I don't, I just don't really care to do that in my life. Like if I start feeling stressed or whatever, it's like just to eat a piece of cheese pizza, man. It's fine. <laughs> that's like, where whatever. I am. You know too. what I mean? It's not yeah. like ultimately my well being is most thing important to me that's why at this point in my life i will not claim anything i've gone through it before i've claimed veganism i've you know i'm this but it's like i do feel great eating vegan for a lot of days but then i'll start craving something that's not vegan and i want to be able to eat that thing without feeling completely guilty like i'm breaking some some vow if I yeah, yeah. eat uh, something that my body is craving like I'm more about that just eating if I crave something you know something that's healthy something which I normally you do crave that kind of stuff sure when I'm craving yeah. that I, I want to eat it if I want cheese then I'm gonna eat some cheese if I want a piece of chicken then I'm gonna eat grilled chicken you know yeah but that's great I mean I think it's it's about you know I mean even just doing it here and there you know, but like, like meatless Mondays or whatever, just sometimes yeah. being like not doing it Absolutely. is cool. And that, and that can help, you know, like yeah. there's no one size fits all for anything, yeah, any diet, 100%. any exercise rec, uh, regime, any medicine, you know, yeah. um, you can't just like say like this for everybody. We're individuals. We have individual biochemistry. We have individual behavioral patterns. Like everything is, is very specific and subjective to you. So like experientially what, what works best for you, you know, like that's, that's what I think is, uh, the where where we decided to put the focus, you know, yeah. um, absolutely, and that my brother brought over some A five Wagyu, yeah, and uh, <laughs> that yeah Wagyu is, <laughs> and if you, and if you're if you're doing it for like the animal, uh, you know, rights yeah. reasons, or you don't want to hurt animals, which is like the reason why I would wouldn't want to eat a lot of yep. meat and stuff. Mm, same, it, it's <clears throat> you don't have to be a militant vegan to like cut down on your animal products consumption. Well, most you can still eat less animal products than the average American yeah. and not be yeah. vegan or, you know, and, go get eggs and, from your neighbor or something like that. You know, there's other options. That's what I was yeah, thinking. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I think that was it is to try to, you know, like that was if anything for us, you know, it's like, we'll still try to do it um, sometimes, you know, and like, um, to like, just be aware of yeah. where the source is coming from to be like, you know, constant, you know, KFOs. Yeah. Yeah. No good. Not you know, good, good song, good. but really good song. Yeah. Great song. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, All actually, right. So Ali Alicia asked, um, "Would you ever play live with oh, yeah. JFAC?" Yeah, I want to. Um, it's just the timing has not worked out thus far. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much what every other member of the band says about playing live shows. Yeah, I know. I want to. I want to <laughs> see Naveen play live yeah, with JFAC. I, I was like, I, I want to be able to be the just a girlfriend at the show. You know, we're like that's I mean, my we man. Probably just, we were like, we just put in, we just have to have Antheos on. We just have to have. Oh, uh, then I have to play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, I would love that. Tracks. We should, we should do that someday. That would be. Yeah, awesome. I mean, there's been some kind of behind the scenes rough talks about it here and there, and uh, yeah, I, yeah like I said, if I was like free to do it, I'd be down. But. Uh, yeah. I think one time, even just, just one time, just for like, yeah, yeah, no, I got to do it for so sure. Sad. I'm down. I'm down. But I then that's the other side of it, it, right? It's like, oh, so we're going to learn all this material for one show. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. It's like, Sometimes it's just cool to say yes to things like that, though. You know, you're talking about how you say yes to everything all the time. I think that that is a good thing to experiment with. Just saying yes to things and seeing how they kind of pan out. Great uh, movie. Do you see that? No. Oh, dude. The Jim Carrey movie. I think it's called Yes, yes Man. Man. Oh, it's no, fucking great. Him. It's fun. We he just does that. It. The whole movie, he has to say yes. It's like a, you know, Tony Robbins comes in or somebody and it's like kind of like shallow Hal type of a deal. Okay. Yeah. But it's great. It's awesome. And it's, 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 it is about that. And he, uh, all this crazy world opens up. And then also like the, the bad side of it, you know what I mean? It's to be like, oh, you can overextend yourself and that kind of shit. But it's a fun movie. Absolutely. Yeah. Amazing. It would be cool to see you play with JFAC one day. Yeah. It would be sick. It would be kind of like a cool full circle thing. Totally. From a, wasn't there an animosity shirt in that first 
video. Yeah. Yeah. Entombment video. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is it really? Yeah. I mean, Johnny's been, you know, singing the animosity praises forever. And I, I didn't hear about animosity till somebody, you know, I think it was actually, I'd see your shirts and stuff, especially the, the gold, the, the foil. bling, the bling, the foil print shirts. <laughs> yeah. Remember those? Yeah. Unfortunately. Remember that yeah. whole era. How could he forget? <laughs> Dude, everyone had those. Those were the shit back in the day. Dude, yeah. maybe it's time. Bring yeah. it back. Dude, <laughs> bring it back. I I mean, I'm just going to, I always thought it was stupid. I was like, dude, that looks so <laughs> dumb. They're really cool. You know, they do wash off really easily. Yeah. Yeah. You can't wash it. That's the no. thing, which means you can't spill anything on it. No. So you like, you wear it, you're really cautious. You don't eat any messy food. And then you put the shirt away and like, you get yeah. to wear it like six times. I don't know if people still make those or not. I, I don't know. I don't think I so. Think. They were they were very MySpace scene era. I know Despised Icon had one. They Animosity. copied. They straight up said that they copied us. Oh yeah. They're like we stole the idea. Yeah. From you guys. Uh, no, was I, it Animosity? I, was you guys first? Yeah. I think you guys might have been first. We were first. Dude, Animosity yeah. was the original like um, merch band to me yeah. in my youth. The original merch band. You would go up to an Animosity merch booth, and they were. 5,000 different designs to choose from. <laughs> you know, it was crazy. You guys are probably the reason that now there are limits on how much merch the opening band can maybe, sell. Actually, maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was funny because I, I, you know, every once in a while I, I hear stories about like the JFAC before I was in it. And um, they would, you know, they would always say like how much they kind of animosity kind of took and cattle, but that I first run. Yeah. You know, that like they're like they kind of showed us the, the ropes, you know, we were just these young kids and they were like super cool. We kind of learned how to do everything from from yeah. animosity. And, I was, and, and we, we like they used to open like like they'd be like the local band on tours that we would play and stuff. And uh, it's funny because I, I know what you're talking about, like kind of the older bands were sort of like bitter about them being like bigger than them. Oh, but yeah. like I was just like, dude, they just got to skip all the shitty stuff that I just did. I was never like a jealous about it. I was just like, that's way sicker. Like, <laughs> yeah, if I had known to do that, I would have done that. Like we yeah. had to play to fucking two people for three or four years before yeah. anybody even knew who we were, you know? So it's I that thought thing it was pretty cool. Like, the jealousy, like to be jealous of success yeah. does not help you be more <laughs> successful. Not at all. And like, no. I met, I'm, I became friends with them like super early on. Like we were friends with them when they were a local band. So that's and then tight. I always thought Johnny was really sick and I wanted him to, uh, to do vocals on my like other project. Flesh from, like, yeah. yeah. I love that record, man. Me Thank too. you. Yeah, I still, I have, uh, I don't have the whole thing done, but I had like 60 or 70% of a song done. Damn. Like it was new flesh rock <clears throat> material. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. And you were using that crazy, that weird little like effect tricks. Oh yeah, like yeah. Kind of sequencer thing yeah, yeah, yeah. on the riff. It was super cool, yeah. <laughs> but I had to drop tune my bass all super low. Yeah, which was weird. Problem. It was like yeah. fucking F sharp or something. Yeah, so it was, it was like hard to be fast because it was like floppy. Yeah, but that shit was sick. I mean, you guys should, you know, I, I, I want to with do, all this extra free time. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I really that is something I want to do, but I want to make it like uh, kind of. Di- I want the material to be a little bit different. I want. I don't want it to be like progressive. I want it to just be like bludgeoning death metal the whole time. Really? I think no that shit. would be awesome. Yeah. Just That'd aggressive, cool, ignorant, like, <laughs> like, that. like if you listen to the flesh Rod album, like kind of half the songs are that type of stuff. Cause that's like what I was really into. And then I kind of got more into like necrophages and like, I was like, let's make it more melodic and like progressive and stuff. And now I'm like, let's just make it fucking brutal and ignorant. That'd that would be, be sick. super sick. Yeah. I would love to hear that. Cause there's already so much of like the, melodic stuff i'm just like yeah let's just that's make true. it fucking i was i always love hearing new stuff like I, i'm i'm really excited to hear this other you know as weird as you guys want to get with entheos i think is fucking awesome to me have you heard the I'm new like, ep yet not yet huh oh, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll send, send it, to it to you yeah yeah okay. the, uh did evan do it yep, yep. He did. How do you he get did. that guy's? How do you get him to do stuff? He lives a couple blocks yeah, away. I'm like, hey, we, we, come had over to, here we had to work? move That's across right. the country, yeah, yeah, yeah. right down I keep the street. Forgetting you guys from in Nashville. Him. I still have yeah, yeah. Cali. We, we moved yeah, directly no. down the street from him and Mark Lewis, and we. Oh, that's fucking perfect. Now we can go over to his house and get so him. Like, can you stop? I was by doing real quick. Some se- go ahead. Sorry. No, nothing. I was just saying we get him to stop by on his way home from work or something. Um, he actually came out to a show for the first time in a really long time. Uh, that havoc run that you yeah that I saw you guys oh, yeah, yeah. oh yeah 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 we saw you there and yes. I was like he was here and he left yeah um 
but uh, I was doing some session stuff down there after that um, for this like band in a box thing. Um, it's this really kind of like, it's like a something that you put on your computer and there's just like a billion different styles of music and you know, you can write and play to it. And it's all like pre-recorded stuff, um, which was really sick. Actually, it was awesome. It was like really good pay and just go into the studio work all day, did it for like four or five days, but like is I had the, no is, time. Does it, uh, write it like in MIDI and you can like export the MIDI, the band in a box thing. Um, I, I don't know. Cause I, I had, cause it was like all recorded played okay. things okay. and I had to do it in every single key and like on the fly too, which I've never really done. I've never had to transpose shit on the fly. You know, uh -huh. maybe a oh, yeah. cover band. I'd be like, oh, let's do it in this. And it'd be a simple whatever song. But I'd be like, all right, here, what do you have for this? Because I didn't have any of the material beforehand. So it'd be like, all right, here's this metal thing. Nico um, played on it, right? Okay. Oh, and sick. I forget the name forget the name of the drummer. But so they'd be like, here's this riff Nico came up with, you know, what would you play to this? And, the, and they're like, all right, go. And I was like, well, let me fucking write something <laughs> for it first, you know? Yeah, but yeah. it would be like, so it'd be like, okay. And I'll kind of write something, a couple takes, be like, all right, that's good, go. And then I would just go through the sheet and just be like, okay, F sharp. Okay, now do it in G. And then and like this and like on the fly. And it was, it was crazy. It was really fun, but I meant to hit you guys up when I was down there, but it was like mad long studio time. Yeah, and I like, oh, yeah. Ubers are brutal, like everywhere now, you know? Yeah. They Cause Sanchez was out at, um, Lewis's and oh, yeah. he was like, come, you know, let's come meet up someplace around here. But the way that like the river or whatever the hell it is works, I was on like the other side of it. So I was like, you know, as the crow flies, like yeah. five minutes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. it was like a 45 minute yeah, up yeah. and around. Yeah. yeah. I believe you're in Mount Juliet, right? That's right. Yeah, dude. It's Mount Juliet might as well be a different state. It's like, <laughs> really? we're, we're, never never been going, there. we're never going out never there. Never been there. Yeah. <laughs> really? We're never How do you guys like there. it there, man? Oh, we love it. We love it. Happy, absolute best. So happy. I don't think I don't think we'll ever move away from Nashville. And more and more people keep moving here. Like you know, Scott Carstairs just moved here. Uh, uh, Scott just moved there. Yeah, yeah. Scott. No Scott lives down the street from us. Uh, Kyle from Fallujah, one of my best no friends way. from Iowa, just moved literally two blocks away from us. So it's it's popping off in Nashville right yeah, now. Dude. It's crazy. That's tight. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if Denver wasn't such a home, I, you know, I've talked about it before. There was a, uh, like a full-time job that would have allowed me to still tour that I almost <laughs> took down in Nashville, like Damn. 2015 or 16 or something. Yeah. So we thought, we thought about it and like kind of looking and stuff and you're like, Oh my God, it's not 1.4 million for yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. 1200 nice. square feet. Yeah. Now, place. now the prices have gone up a bit. I think that we got in just in time. We bought the house in 2021 and now the market's kind of going up but going nuts yeah did you guys buy bit. yes oh good for we you we did good for you Thanks, that's awesome <laughs> yeah it's, you guys are killing it power couple insane, thank you thank you <laughs> the the definitive power couple all know, right <laughs> <laughs> we love you man thank you so much for yeah, hanging dude. out and chilling Hell with yeah. us on the podcast it's been a great time just catching up and i hope that we get yeah. hang out soon yeah we don't ever get to really like hang this long because we haven't uh -huh. toured yeah, and then yeah. like, you know you go to each other's shows or something there's a billion people you know oh, dude, like yeah. hang and shit so anytime you guys want to come to denver we got an extra bedroom right here yeah, we, we have really two i'm really surprised my cats didn't come up usually though when i'm at the computer working they'll pop up oh, and yeah. i think you guys would like our cats your cat people yeah yeah we have three now you got a third one we yeah. did and he's the best one we've gotten so far so now i'm like maybe we should get a fourth that one will be even better <laughs> what are your cat's names? Uh, Gizmo is the youngest, Pappy and Shiva. Sweet. Yeah. That's what are awesome. your cat's names? Seneca and Giuseppe. Oh, God, I love they're cats, fucking, man. They're so yeah, great. They're, they're awesome, the dude. Yeah, love. they're like as close as, you know, sorry, mom, but probably the, as close as to kids as she's, uh, <laughs> as close as to grandkids as she, she calls them her grandcats. That's what my mom says. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so do our moms. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking great, dude. Yeah, I know, That's man. Awesome. I know. That's great. Well, thank you guys so much for having yeah, me on dude, the thanks, Thank you for fucking making this record. Dude, what it was, man. Thanks yeah. for having me. Are you you guys me? It was great. You guys really made a sick record, and I think it's amazing, and I'm excited for every the whole world to get to hear what you guys did because it's really thank good. Thank you. Hell yeah, man. Hell yeah. All right, dude. Um, we'll talk to you soon. Cool. I will see you uh, tomorrow for the AMA then. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll hit you up about it. What's the, What time was that going on at? Uh, just text me. Okay. So yeah. that's in the Deathcore cool. Deathcore subreddit that people can catch you guys AMA tomorrow. Yeah, I think it's like uh wait, is tomorrow Thursday? Or wait, no, not tomorrow. I thought it was Friday. on Friday. The day of the record. Oh, it's on, yeah. Friday. It's on Friday. It's record release day. 
Okay. That's right. Okay. okay. Yeah, okay. But I have a YouTube. I have it on my calendar tomorrow. on Friday, so I was like, maybe I'm wrong, and okay. it's tomorrow. And I was just trying to play it off. They're actually, if you're not busy tomorrow, uh, there is that Metal Blade asked if you wanted to do it, and obviously we're, you know, I would always have you if, whenever you're down to do it. But there's a, a YouTube premiere of the whole record tomorrow. We'll go and hang for thirty okay. minutes or something. You're more than welcome, and we would love to have you. Yeah, you just, just tell me what time. I'll definitely do it. Hell yeah, sick. All right, well, we'll be talking the next two days then. Sounds Hell good, man. Yeah. All right, brother. All right, everyone well, check guys, out. Man. Yeah, we love you. Everyone love you, check out you, Nick. Nick. Check out the new JFAC and much love, dude. We love All right, you so peace, much. Brother. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night, man. Peace. All right, and with that, we will end the podcast for this week. Thank you so much, everyone, for hanging out for the entire podcast. That was a great chat with Nick. We fucking yeah. went really long on that one. That was awesome. Yeah. So uh, a lot of good stuff in there. We could probably do like a six-hour podcast with Nick. I mean, we didn't I'm even sure. talk about like tons of stuff we, that we, could talk we about. have we do go way back with nick so it's it's good to catch up with him and yeah. you know see how things are going but all right you guys make sure to check out that new job for a cowboy this week it comes out on friday moon healer is the name of the album and you're going to be hearing about it for a while so all go right. and uh, get on it are we going to do a post show or just call it uh we'll, like, we'll sit in the post show for a second all right. all right you guys we love you so much have a great week We'll see you next time. Yep. Once again, another episode of Coffer Crab in the books. Next And next week, I believe we have a tour announcement as well. So All right. See you guys next week with that tuned. tour announcement. Well, we got to play the new Kim Petrus. Well, you're talking over the outro. <laughs> oh.